For the record, my name is Tania Fernandez Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded and it is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash dash forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. The council budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly re encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways. Attend one of our hearings and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at each department or hearing and also at two hearings dedicated to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Our scheduled hearings dedicated two public testimonies are, were April 26 at 6 p.m. and today at 6 p.m. virtually. You can give testimony in person here in the chamber or virtually via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance. For virtual testimony, you can sign up by using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc w dot wm again that's ccc dot wm at boston dot gov when you are called to testify please state your name and affiliation residents and limit your comments to a few minutes or two minutes um, a couple of minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard or email your written testimony to the committee at ccc dot wm at boston dot gov or submit a two-minute video of your testimony through the form on our website. For more information on the City Council budget process and how to testify, please visit the City Council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on dockets 04802042. Orders for the FY23 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for the other post-employment benefits, OPEB. Docket 0483, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. Dockets 0484 to 0486, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Dockets 0483. 0493 to 0495 orders for arts and culture and tourism revolving funds dockets 0499 orders for the boston equity fund for our focus area for this hearing will be office of economic opportunity of inclusion oeoi including the equity fund Office of Tourism, Sports and Entertainment, including Tourism Revolving Fund. Office of Arts and Culture, including Arts and Culture Revolving Funds. Our panelists for today's hearing are Shagun Iduo, Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion. Sarah Delude, Director of Operations, Office of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion. Midori Morikawa, Deputy Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, Alicia Porcena, Director of Small Business, Office of Economic Opportunity <coughs> and Inclusion, Amy Yandel, Interim Director, Office of Tourism, Sports and Entertainment, Cara Ortega, Elliot Ortega, Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. If I've, if I've introduced you and you're um, waiting for your turn, um, we're just going to be hearing from Office of Economic Opportunity first. And when, once you begin to um, present, please state your name and title once again so that we can um, do away with the mix up. I am joined here by my counselor colleague, President Council of Flynn, Ed Flynn, District 2 and Councillor Brian Worrell, District 4.
Just um, for your information, uh, to give you a, a bit of um, idea of what the agenda will look like, you will have uh, approximately 20 minutes. You, I will time you and you'll hear the timer go off. If you need more time, just um, ask for it. I'll allow you another five minutes. We'll go to a round of questions. Um, eight, each council will have eight minutes and it's up to them to moderate their time. Uh, then we'll go to public testimony and then a second round, again, at eight minutes and then a third round if time allows it. Um, but I think for this one, we'll probably try to do an hour and a half each department, um, maybe an hour for uh, the departments that are smaller um, so that we can stay within four hours of all three departments. <clears throat> And um, just a quick note, um, I, Chief Odu, I know that you have to leave at noon, um, so hopefully that hour and a half um, is capped at noon and you are able to go to your next schedule on time. I'd like to um, just acknowledge that we've also been joined by my council colleague, um, Aaron Murphy, at large. Okay, without further ado, um, you now have the floor for your presentation. Thank you and good morning, Madam Chair, um, and to all of the uh, counselors who are here in attendance. Um, and just to, for clarification as well, um, different team members may wind up needing to leave, uh, you know, over that time period. Uh, I know that there were some scheduling challenges on their end as well. So just wanted to, I wasn't sure if that was what was communicated. It sounds like it was just me that was communicated. It, it, it was just you. Um, did you want to clarify that now? What time do people have to leave? So I know I have to leave at noon, and I believe my other team members will need to leave before one or two, um, just for different parts of their schedule and meetings that are coming up. So typically, hearings are scheduled for three hours, and I normally like to ask my colleagues what they feel comfortable with. I would hate to like have to call you back again. Mm -hmm. If people feel they have not gotten their questions answered, they may request to bring you back again. So um, understood. It sounds like before <clears throat> one, it sounds like everyone has to leave within two hours and a half. Uh, I think we'll while we're sitting here, we'll work out what's what's possible. Yeah, I think I think it's doable considering. Um, I was probably only going to give you two hours so that I can do an hour <coughs> of the other departments mm -hmm. each. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully that's the case and my council, hopefully my council colleagues uh, agree. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, joined here by team members Midori, Sarah, and Alicia who will introduce themselves uh, throughout this presentation. Um, just want to clarify up at the top that while our cabinet is called uh, Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, we will only be discussing the department, which has the same name, which I know is confusing, and it took me a month to understand <laughs> department versus unit versus office versus cabinet and all that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, so we'll be discussing the Department of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, which includes the business strategy and small business units. And later today, uh, the Department of Tourism, Sports, and Entertainment, which is a part of the cabinet, will also be presenting uh, on their budget. Um, and so this means that our uh, conversation will center on the programs and activities uh, on the screen now conducted by our department. Today marks 150, uh, day 150 for our new team. And one of the first things we did was to establish new cabinet-wide mission and vision statements. And here's a quick synopsis of uh, those statements uh, on the screen now. I'm not gonna go through the whole mission. As you can see, it takes up an entire book page, uh, but it's a work in progress. Uh, but the bolded words highlight uh, key aspects that will guide our work, and they lead to our broader vision, which is one of a resilient, uh, equitable, sustainable, and vibrant city that centers its people and creates opportunities to build generational wealth. As I mentioned this word, equity, I want to pause briefly to reiterate that we have adopted the administration's working definition of equity, which is a proactive process of providing historically excluded communities the resources they need to live and thrive in Boston. As I mentioned at the hearing this past Friday, our focus is on establishing racial equity as a means of addressing historic inequities across the city. 
With this more nuanced focus, it means that all future presentations at hearings will show our efforts to direct resources to who and where they are needed most. And finally, here is a quick review of who's helping to do this work. We're proud of the fact that we are one of the most diverse departments with close to 70% of staff identifying as persons of color and close to 60% identifying as female. We're also excited at the opportunity to use existing job openings to help further increase our diversity, particularly in the areas of AAPI and Latino employees. To lead the conversation of what was achieved in the first half of the fiscal year of 2022 and how the new team has built on this success in these last 150 days, I'll now turn it over to Alicia Porsena. Thank you, Chief Iduwu. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Committee on Ways and Means. My name is Alicia Porsena, and I am the Director of Small Business for OEOI. So our team provides the 40,000 plus small businesses in Boston with the tools and guidance to successfully start, relocate, grow, and build a business in Boston. Through our programs and resources, we connect entrepreneurs with city agencies to access permitting, licensing, and other services to address challenges business owners are facing. So if you look here, there's a SHAP shot. I would like to note that the data on this slide and the following slides are from business owners who have self-identified in the application and therefore the figures shown can be higher than presented. The Small Business Relief Fund was launched in September of 2021 and replenished in January of 2022 and it awarded small businesses up to $20,000. These grants were designed to help businesses in the hardest hit industries to cover business expenses in the areas of recovery and growth. I want to co commend the work of my team of 11 who work days, nights, and weekends to review 3,000 applications and provide one-on-one -on -one support to business owners seeking to better understand the process. To date, the work, the, we have worked to distribute $12.3 million in grants in, covering um, 984 businesses and counting. This map shows the distribution of grants, uh, grants across the city of Boston. All 23 neighborhoods in Boston are represented on the grass, on the map, which means that um, all neighborhoods receive some form of small business relief funds. If we look at the breakdown in between industries where the grant went to, the highlighted roles are the industries that were prioritized for the grant so food service and production, restaurants, barbershops, salons, child care services, retail, fitness and wellness, and recreation. In terms of the gender breakdown, approximately 58% of the grants went to women-owned businesses, and 68% of the leave funds went to minority-owned businesses, which is representative, which is more representative of the city's breakdown. About 39% of grant recipients had a residential address in Boston, and 18% of the grants um, voluntarily identified themselves as immigrant-owned businesses. Grants are um, a new part of our work as a small business team. Other programming and projects are the majority of what we do. This work is centered around the people of Boston. We try to meet people where they are and provide resources and services that ad address their needs. From main streets to restore and design and technical assistance, these funds go directly into the community, which add to the cultural vibrancy and makeup of our neighborhoods. As we make a concentrated effort to go directly to people, like our weekly business walks, as you can see in the pictures and the slides, we seek to provide programming and initiatives that will intentionally support our historically excluded communities. I've learned a lot in my three months here, and the team has learned a lot in the last year. As Maya Angelou says, do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. We know better now and have the opportunity and resources to do better, and I look forward to working with all of you to do that. Now I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Sarah Deloon. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Sarah Deloon, I'm the Director of Operations for the Office of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, and I'm pleased to speak with you to briefly highlight some of our innovative programmatic accomplishments that were supported <laughs> both by operating and external funds this year. First up is our Restaurant Revitalization Fund, launched in partnership with Lydia Edwards and the Office of Workforce Development, which the, was the result of a roundtable we held with the restaurant industry to support their recovery. We partnered with 85 restaurants to issue business relief grant funding, launch a multilingual marketing campaign to both help restaurants attract workers and encourage diners to dine out in Boston, 
and to support 582 restaurant workers by offering retention bonuses and tuition assistance incentives. <clears throat> Next, in partnership with the Office of Tourism, Sports, and Entertainment, we launched the all-inclusive Boston Tourism Campaign in April of 2021 to aid in the recovery of the tourism industry, which was previously our third largest industry. We're spotlighting all neighborhoods, local businesses, and attracting new travelers to Boston. In phase one, we focused on local drive traffic and attracted 4,000 new visits to Boston. In phase two, launched just last month, we have expanded across the Northeast. All Inclusive has a very diverse team of internal and external stakeholders. We're proud to have awarded the largest non-construction contract to a minority-owned business at the time. We know this changed last month, uh, excuse me, this month. And 84% of the subcontractors were women and minority-owned businesses. And lastly, together with the Office of New Urban Mechanics, we launched Be Local, a free mobile app that rewards users for shopping and dining at small businesses across our city. User-generated spending resulted in a total economic impact of $1.9 million with over 2,000 participating small businesses. I also should note here that 77% of the total payments for businesses went to self-identified black-owned, women-owned, and immigrant-owned businesses. So with that, I'll turn it over to our Deputy Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, Midori Morikawa. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, Madam Chair, Council President Flynn, and members of the committee. My name is Midori Morikawa, and I am the Deputy Chief for the uh, Cabinet. Um, so you've seen some of the accomplishments from our team around small business engagement as it relates to COVID recovery. Now I'd like to discuss some of our work in other areas of Cabinet, the Business Strategy Unit, which leads on business attraction, retention, and engagement. We focus on high growth industries such as startups, life sciences, and technology industries, as well as cannabis industry. We also oversee, excuse me, global affairs team, which I know many counselors have been an important part to showcase that the city's connection to international community in Boston, as well as around the world, to represent the city as a global city and a hub for jobs, businesses, investors, and innovation. We have two staff members who lead a cannabis equity program with both the technical assistance program and the equity fund program. The 2019 Ordinance on Equitable Regulation of Cannabis aims to ensure equity in Boston's cannabis industry by providing funding and technical assistance to cannabis entrepreneurs from backgrounds and neighborhoods mostly impacted by war on drugs. Last year around this time, there were only 17 equity applicants. But as you can see on the slide, there are currently 45 equity applicants with 30 more in the queue, thanks to the work of our team. Our technical assistance program for cannabis industry is robust and continues to expand. Both the types of technical assistance program and what the equity funds were used for are in the slide. On April 13th, uh, together with many of our colleagues at City Hall, we welcome back people downtown called the Boston Blooms Block Party as part of our strategy to revitalize downtown neighborhood. We look forward to continuing to build on downtown and neighborhood level programming particularly focused on repurposing city streets for joy and active recreation. One of our cabinet's key priorities is to allow small business owners to build assets, including owning properties. This past year, we have worked with a number of businesses in the slide to help them acquire their property, both for commercial and mixed use purposes. We look forward to working to develop a more formal program in the next few months. I'll now turn it back to Shigun to discuss our budget request. Thank you. Um, so on the next slide uh, is just a quick highlight of what our uh, request is. Um, so as you'll see, that uh, we're, our budget uh, this year, our request uh, is an increase from what it was in FY22, and this is for three key reasons. The first is our effort to shift uh, our small business team members off of federal funding to the city's operating budget. Uh, and this is because federal requirements severely limit the type of work that our team members can do and who they can do it for. And so shifting salaries to the operating budget is going to provide more flexibility and allow them to work with many more small businesses across the city. Second is our desire to further support Main Streets. Similarly, shifting, from fed uh, shifting their budget from federal funds to the city budget, allowing us to support them at the beginning of the fiscal year rather than at the end. And this is something we talked about last Friday. 
Uh, and third is to establish a new permanent grant fund to support Boston's legacy businesses. Uh, this summer, our office uh, is going to launch a legacy business program, which will be sharing more information with all of your offices uh, shortly on this as a way to sustain landmark businesses and acknowledge their contribution to the local culture. This grant fund will provide operating and growth support. Our office has also uh, developed uh, new metrics under our four priority categories to guide our work and inform future programming. We're going to spend this year collecting baseline data uh, under each of these metrics to help determine what goals uh, that we'll set for it in future uh, budget cycles. So with that, I will end uh, the OEOI uh, presentation and hand it off to Tourism. Good morning, Madam Chair, Councillors. My name is Amy Yandel, and I am currently the Interim Director of Tourism. I'm sorry. Tourism. Are we doing this together? Tourism oh. under economic I apologize. I thought that was the... I oh, no, might have no, understood no. incorrectly. Okay, so oh, then. No. Okay, we don't wait. Have to, yeah. Um, yeah, we. I would like to uh, tackle each separately. Oh, cool. If okay. that's okay with you. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, and then if I can have uh, Miss Alicia. Thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing your presentation. Miss, uh, sorry. Your name? Amy. Miss Amy, sorry. Okay. Um, we'll go. We'll go to our round of questions and get you out of the way, and then we'll get to tourism. Okay. Uh, Council President Flynn, you you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the important work you are doing, Madam Chair, on on these important issues. And thank you to the administration team that is presenting before us and for your, your leadership as well. Um, so I guess my, my comment, and then I'll, I'll ask a brief question, um, as, as we continue this discussion on economic opportunity in, in Boston, during during the pandemic, um, we certainly saw many immigrant communities impacted the most, especially women-owned businesses or immigrant-owned businesses. So, how are we able to work with? One of, one of the challenges I have in, in, in Chinatown, and I know, Chief, you've been with me several times on walkthroughs, um, some challenges we have at times can be um, language access. We can have immigration challenges at times. We can have um, other challenges as well. Um, but how can we make sure that even though we may have these challenges, for women-owned or immigrant-owned businesses, that they're still part of the process, even though we have to work with them on language, communication, immigration. We want to make sure that they are included regardless of any, any obstacles or challenges that we, we have. So just want to ask what your, your thoughts are. And again, I know you're very inclusive in, in, in working with immigrant-owned re restaurants and, and businesses, which, which I support as well. But what is your philosophy as we work closely with immigrant-owned um, businesses? Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. President. So, you know, one of the things that I shared uh, last week at our hearing on ARPA related to immigrant-owned businesses, and I do want to delve a little bit more into that uh, description as well, uh, is, it, first of all, it starts with our own team makeup um, and where we are lacking, particularly as we're talking about Chinatown or as we're thinking about um, uh, Fields Corner area where we have many uh, Vietnamese-owned restaurants, uh, our team does not reflect uh, either of these communities. and. You know, what I shared in my opening comments is that we're uh, very much looking forward to using the openings we have right now on our team to address uh, that disparity on our team. So that's one of the first pieces. I will say that, you know, 
prior to my arrival, I think the small business team did a pretty good job of making sure that uh, whether it was applications uh, for grants uh, or providing technical assistance to businesses, that these things were made available in uh, languages that represented uh, all cultural backgrounds across the city of Boston, as well as our regular phone calls during the pandemic, uh, the weekly Tuesday small business calls that were uh, translated in various languages uh, that, uh, that reflect the makeup of the city. Um, all in all, we do our best to make sure that every community uh, is represented in programming that we're coming up with, initiatives, et cetera. I know one of the tacks that we're taking as we're developing new programs is engaging organizations like the Main Streets that uh, reflect all cultural backgrounds across the city, ensuring that people's voices are heard before we roll something out versus uh, what sometimes happens in government, which is government doing a thing uh, and, uh, and then fixing it along the way. So th these are some of the ways that we're attempting to work. Thank you, Chief, and my mm -hmm. final my final question, are you carefully planning to hire staff that speak Spanish, that speak Vietnamese, that speak Cantonese um, as you go forward? Is that a, is that a priority? Absolutely. On the um, Spanish-speaking front, we are proud to have at least uh, three or four of our members uh, who are fluent in uh, Spanish. And you know whether it's taking phone calls and addressing issues there, being in person on our business walks uh, to engage with business owners uh, along the way. Um, you know, I think we've done a good job of making sure that uh, the Spanish speaking part of our population is well represented. But you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, absolutely, we're prioritizing Asian American uh, communities in our hiring because this is where we lack uh, at the moment uh, and want to be intentional about making sure that those communities are, uh, are impacted by our work. Well, I'm glad you acknowledged that and appreciate your honesty and professionalism. Um, so do we have in your, on your team people that speak Vietnamese or, or Cantonese? Uh, Vietnamese, not that I'm aware of. Uh, Cantonese, um, I believe we have at least one member of our team who does speak Cantonese. Um, but you know, one is not enough either, right? And, and zero is definitely not acceptable uh, for any of these uh, languages. So that it is a priority for us. And just, um, I'm, I'm, I know we're going to be speaking on tourism later. Um, I, I may be out for that discussion as I have 11 o'clock meeting. Um, but one thing I want to want to do is continue to work with you, Chief, on bringing tourists to Boston and bringing tourists to our immigrant neighborhoods as well, and bringing tourists to immigrant-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, and working to have a good plan to make sure that all neighborhoods are represented and that tourists get a good feel, get a good flavor of, of, the, city, of the city when they do come here instead of spending their money and time just exclusively in the downtown area. But I know that's a commitment and top priority, priority of yours as well, Chief. Yes, sir, it is. And uh, you know, that's why we're also excited about the opportunity of being able to hire a new director of tourism, sports, and entertainment. We are uh, very lucky and appreciative of the fact that Amy Yandel has been serving in an interim capacity and has served this department for many years. Um, but as we're uh, looking to hire uh, for this new role, uh, this person will absolutely have that same mission of, um, of uniting all of our neighborhoods and ensuring that uh, we are turning our neighborhoods into destinations as opposed to continuing what exists right now, uh, which is people just visiting one of four places uh, in the city. So I agree. Thank you, Chief. And I had the opportunity to work with Amy many times on different, different events, and she's been very professional um, in working with her. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, Madam Chair, I don't have any further comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council President Flynn. Um, Amy, I am so sorry. So I, re I realized the, how it makes sense now. I didn't, re I didn't uh, know that it was going to be together. Um, we had an agreement as councils on how to take this on. But if you can join us now, <laughs> I'm sorry to do this to you um, and just wrap this up together.
Welcome so we'll back. start over. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, as we're all aware now, my name is Amy Yandel, and I'm currently the Interim Director of Tourism, Sports, and Entertainment. Um, our department's mission is to advance tourism and promote public participation in public celebrations for both residents and visitors to our city. We do this by producing and supporting events across the city, by supporting film and TV production, and by marketing the city to conventions and visitors. Tourism, Sports, and Entertainment is a very small department composed of 10 full and part-time employees, 40% female and 60% male, and 30% 30 of, 30 of our employees identify as black and 70% as white. We are committed to ensuring that our office reflects the diversity of our city and are mindful of that when hiring new employees. Our office produces annual public celebrations that include the Dr. Martin Luther King Day celebration, One Boston Day, the Donna Summer Disco Party, Gospel Fest, and the Mayor's Trolley Tour, to name a few. And we're really excited to bring back the Dance Party Series to the plaza again this summer, and we'll feature salsa, R&B, house, and kizomba music and dancing. We also support neighborhood events throughout the city. I'm sorry. And here's a sampling. The Anderson Tree Lighting in High Park, Bams Fest in Roxbury, the Caribbean Festival, the Chinatown Lion Dance, the North End Feasts, the Greek Parade, Green Fest, the Haitian Parade, Juneteenth, Roxbury Unity Parade, the St. Patrick's Day Parade, Vietnamese American Community Cookout, and various tree lightings across the city. we are looking forward to um, future events. For example, the 250th anniversary of our country will take place in 2026. We are already working with Councilor Bach and our partners along the Freedom Trail and across the city and region to make sure that this occasion is a grand celebration for the city of Boston. 2026 will mark 250 years since the American colonies declared independence from the British Empire but Boston will also celebrate the 200th anniversary of other important dates that predating the, predated the signing of the Declaration of Independence, such as the Boston Tea Party and the Boston Massacre. We are anxiously awaiting FIFA's decision later this month to learn if Boston is selected as one of the 10 North American cities to host the 2026 uh, World Cup. The 2026 FIFA World Cup will be the largest to date with 80 matches and 48 national teams slated to take place. 60 in the United States, 10 in Canada, and 10 in Mexico. The Boston Consulting Group's research has estimated that individual 2026 FIFA World Cup host cities can expect to see up to 450,000 visitors and a potential net economic impact of up to $480 million. We're also anxiously awaiting to see if we've been awarded um, the honor of hosting the Army-Navy game. We've bidded for the years 2023 to 2027, and the focus is on 2023 because Boston's ready. This game is played the second week of December, and the game has never been hosted in New England. It's anticipated the event would attract over 40,000 out-of-state visitors and it'd generate approximately 35 to $40 million in economic impact. We are also working closely with the organizers for BAMS Fest, um, the Boston Art Music Soul Festival, and it's one of the fastest growing urban arts and uh, music festivals in the city that celebrates Afrocentric identity and black artistry, all while amplifying the voices and creative contributions from local, regional, and national entertainers of color. Other events on the horizon include the Boston Unity Cup, the National Main Streets Conference, the NAACP Conference, WWE Friday Night Smackdown, the NHL Winter Classic, and the NCAA Women's Lacrosse Championships. Our office is committed to making sure that the City of Boston is, has an array of fun events for residents and visitors alike to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Council Rowell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to the panel for all the great work that they have done here in the city of Boston, and not just being in City Hall doing the work, but getting out there, meeting with the business owners. So I, I, I truly appreciate that. Um, 
One of my questions um, is piggybacking off of uh, Councilor Ed Flynn, uh, the tourism and making every neighborhood a destination. Can you tell me, talk to me about your work with uh, the budget office on creating the infrastructure? Because some of the event spaces that we see throughout the city, we don't have in certain neighborhoods to host, you know, outdoor events. Can you talk to me about how, what your what your work with with the capital and capital plan, the budget. Um, in order to make sure that we have those event spaces um, to make sure that we can host those type of events in all parts of our neighborhoods. So I'm not sure, well, I'm not sure if there was um, previous uh, or was a previous conversation happening, but certainly happy to entertain engaging the budget office on identifying uh, spaces where, you know, where these things could exist. Um, so I would include working with your office, neighborhood groups, others, um, haven't heard uh, yet from folks that are looking for additional spaces, but happy to entertain that conversation. Awesome. Um, and then going back to um, the 2021 executive order that required um, every department must develop and submit a plan for racial and gender conscious goals and procurement. Um, have you worked, can you talk to me about your role in helping other departments create um, those plans, knowing that you guys are out in front, hearing from all the um, all the businesses. Well, and I, I just do want to note as well that um, this is a separate department uh, that does that. The uh, office, well, it'll, the new name will be the Office of Supplier and Workforce Diversity um, that works with the procurement plan. And um, today we're on the OEOI department, but on the procurement plans, um, the so this happens in two ways. It is the Office of Workforce and Supplier Diversity uh, that works with the procurement team in the budget office. I know this sounds confusing, but we're also seeking to try to centralize all this. That's another <laughs> conversation. But these two teams work together uh, to, so at the beginning of the budget process, um, attached to, you know, you'll we'll receive a packet um, that kind of helps us figure out how to put it all together. And another attachment to that is uh, uh, giving the uh, department the ability to identify from their contracts uh, what of that could be uh, used for equitable procurement. Um, and so this was written in a way, again, prior to uh, our arrival, uh, Selena Barrios-Milner, who was leading the equity team at that time, uh, who did a great job of ensuring that it would coincide with one another. Um, but anyway, uh, the condensed version of this is at the beginning of the budget process, the two teams work together. Uh, procurement uh, works with budget to make those items available. The supplier diversity team works with different department heads to identify businesses that might be able to uh, fulfill whatever contracts they might be requesting for the new year. Awesome. Um, and $1.4 million of permanent positions in the operating budget. Can you, can you tell us what those positions are? So this is the small business team. And I do want to note that this is a, a, this is a phased approach. If we were to try to put everybody on the budget, this it would have looked, y'all would have looked at us a little <laughs> funny uh, of trying to increase the budget by that much. But um, when I came into this role uh, back in January, one of the things that I discovered in the review is that outside of Alicia, uh, the entire small business team is paid through federal funds. Mm -hmm. uh, the city is not paying them. Um, and so because of this, you know, it's, it's through the Community Development Block Grant, which has specific requirements uh, and duties uh, for uh, these employees. And it also means that they can only allocate 100% of their time toward whatever those duties uh, and areas are. Um, and so by shifting, you know, piecemeal them onto the operating budget, more and more of their time can go to supporting other uh, businesses, uh, doing other services. And I'll just say in, in 10 seconds, this is again related to what we talked about last week uh, on Friday, um, where for instance, we put some of our funding toward East Boston uh, to cover restore projects because CDBG funds don't cover certain areas of East Boston, even though we know that it's an area or neighborhood that, re that requires that additional support. So uh, you know, similarly, we don't want to limit the ability of our team members to support, uh, particularly communities of color, even if they don't fall within federal designated uh, spaces. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and love the idea of the um, new legacy business plan. Could you just dive a little bit more into, into that? Yes. and. Um, all of your offices are going to be receiving a memo within the next few weeks uh, just outlining the highlights of this. So 
Uh, the Legacy Business Program is something that was started uh, roughly 10 years ago in San Francisco when uh, a previous economic crash uh, in the country occurred. They're happening too frequently closer together. Um, and uh, this was a way for San Francisco to try to save businesses that had been around for 40 or more years that were just closing left and right. And so they actually have the, one of the most robust programs in the city, in, in uh, the country, uh, where you know they go through this process of the community helping to identify, you know, what's their favorite business that's been around for uh, their level is 40 years. We're lowering that, um, and then whoever is selected that year, they go through a fancy ceremony. You know, they get acknowledged. But San Francisco has a fund that, uh, similar to what we're proposing, uh, that will help uh, a business, you know, with operating expenses, rent, et cetera. But they also work with them to help them uh, acquire property, say, so that they're not faced with uh, displacement. So similarly, we are modeling our program off of San Francisco. We are reducing the number of years from 40 years to 10 years because, you know, we, we developed, and again, this is prior to our arrival, but the team developed a list of roughly 200, 250 businesses that could be considered legacy businesses, but we could only do that by lowering the number of years because when you just uh, leave it at 40 years or 30 years, pretty much all the legacy businesses would be white uh, and would only be in certain communities. And so, you know, we know uh, just by living and growing up in Boston that a number of our businesses, even before the pandemic, would be around for 10 years, maybe less, but because of challenges that we have always talked about, they don't survive beyond that. Um, and so we wanted to lower that barrier, invite more folks in, connect them to a resource that will always be available, a permanent fund, because it's in our operating budget, um, and then work with them to uh, help them grow and scale. Uh, you know, we talked last week about uh, cooperatives, and so it, it's an opportunity for us to also explore uh, uh, succession planning and transition to cooperatives, and then again on our ownership uh, tack as well, uh, helping folks acquire uh, their property. And then the 75K for placemaking outside of Main Street's district. Um, love to hear more about your idea around that. Sure, sure. And this is really uh, to make sure that um, as we're thinking about events and activities and programs across the city, that we have some funding that falls outside of the Main Street's area. So, you know, what we proposed last week uh, was a $4 million investment in Main Street's uh, to increase their, uh, not just their operating budget, but also, um, uh, the programmatic budget and beautification, but Main Streets only cover certain areas of, uh, of the city, as we talked about last week. And so when we're thinking about places like Blue Hill Ave, mm -hmm. uh, that aren't covered at all uh, by Main Streets, or um, uh, Codman Square, uh, I don't believe is uh, covered by Main Street, um, you know, this funding will allow uh, for those areas to tap in and utilize those resources for placemaking opportunities that they wouldn't be able to utilize Main Street's funding for. And la last question, Madam Chair, is is 75K enough for Blue Hill Lab, Norfolk Street, Carmen Square? Like, do you think that's enough? Well, I'm certainly happy to explore uh, increasing uh, that number. Um, you know, I will say this uh, budget was developed within the first two weeks uh, of our uh, being here uh, in this new role. Uh, and so happy to explore what that increase could look like. Uh, but really what we see FY23 as being is baseline level setting so that next year when we're coming back to the council to say we want to see, you know, X number of dollars here, we can say based on this data that we've collected, we actually think we need X thousands of dollars for placemaking because we saw so much uh, desire uh, across the city. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Really excited to, to be here. Um, I'm just gonna just dive into some of my questions. Um, I'm, as you know, I'm particularly uh, concerned about immigrant-owned businesses here in Boston, um, particularly our barber shops and hair salons. And in Boston, physical items such as barber chairs um, can be accessed um, and taxed, which can impact business profits, and I'm just curious, how is the small business unit and OEOI working with the assessing department to make it easier for immigrant businesses such as barbershops and hair salons to thrive? So I don't think we were aware of that, but I'm definitely going to be reaching out to it, assessing this week to talk about addressing that. Yes, that is a yeah. big concern. We mm -hmm. actually um, got a, a, um, a bill sent to us uh, from a business that basically 
according to them, they were assessed up to $10,000 mm. in um, personal quote unquote property tax at their specific store. And it's not just barbershops and hair salons, it's all different types of businesses. Mm -hmm. And they self assessed it at um, 77,000. Mm. Um, so that's a big uh, discrepancy. And I think yeah. that that definitely needs some um, support especially because a lot of immigrant owned businesses do not understand or help or um, have a hard time with reading and writing in English. So when they get bills like this, it is alarming to them. So they need a lot of support in this um, area. So I just, I would appreciate you all looking into and it. And if you don't mind, Counselor, um, I'm not sure when that information was received, but if you wouldn't mind forwarding that to the small business team so we can follow up and address that. Yeah, and just so you know, Chief, this is an issue that I brought up last year as well, so it's not something that is new. This is consistent, and mm -hmm. at some point, somebody's gonna need to do something about it. Sure. So I'm looking to you to be that person. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, and speaking of barbershops, the Institute of, um, for Justice found that the um, prospect restaurant owners must go through 92 <coughs> steps in the city just to open up shop. Um, and um, prospective barber shop owners must go through 81 or 82. That's a lot of steps. Um, and, and these are business models that are especially important in the immigrant community. And it seems like we're setting up roadblock after roadblock for them to be able to succeed. So I'm just curious, what are we doing to streamline the process and creating more one-on-one -on -one interventions with small businesses to team up with supportive um, prospective um, immigrant business owners? Yeah, so on this report, and I appreciate you bringing that up, um, it's a big book uh, that, <laughs> that they put together. Um, so one of the things that we've already started doing is actually engaging this institute, because um, uh, you know, for us, again, that just started interesting and new information, uh, that we want to delve into, and we appreciate Councilor Worrell's office for putting us in touch with this group uh, to talk more about it. Um, I don't want to jump in front of Alicia, but I do know that we've started the conversation about identifying what actually are those uh, licensing or permitting barriers that are in place so that we can then begin uh, to better address this question that you asked. Um, here's what we're doing to eliminate things that don't make any sense to actually still be there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just going to ask a quick follow-up. I know you had talked about your staffing and the diversity, but I'm curious in terms of just really being able to have a specialized, you know, division or department of folks who can help immigrant owned businesses navigate. Cause I don't see this work as just people being able to speak the language. There's a lot of technical assistance that is required when you're literally holding someone's hand through the entire process. So I'm just curious about what that level of expertise looks like. In and, when, and when we are discussing, and I you know, was mentioning this in my response to Councillor Flynn's question, because I do want to drill down on even who we're talking about uh, when we say immigrant. Um, you know, last week when you brought up this issue, uh, you mentioned being in the room with Cape Verdeans, Dominicans, which is important. And I just wanted to be clear on our end who we're talking about when we say immigrant. Because I know that-, that mm -hmm. I'm talking about, they're everyone who's foreign born okay. and is doing business here in the city of Boston. Okay. Um, that is everyone and all means all for me. Indeed. So yes. every single immigrant business that's here in the city of Boston mm -hmm. needs support mm -hmm. and there needs to be um, resources poured into that so that you can thrive. And I also believe that the of, um, Office of Immigrant Advancement could be a place where there could be some sort of collaboration there so that it just mm -hmm. doesn't fall on you. Mm -hmm. But I definitely do believe that based on the conversations that we've been having and also as a result of COVID, we have realized that a lot of our immigrant owned businesses who experience language barriers and also how to set up shop here in the city of Boston mm -hmm. have struggled. Yeah. So, and I know that, uh, you know, again, when I first started here, uh, Moya was already doing a little bit of work to support immigrant owned businesses. We started conversations and, you know, uh, congratulations to Yusufi on his transition to a new role. I will say that uh, those conversations with Moya are ongoing, but I do uh, just want to, again, uh, lift up the work that our small business team, which does cover a broad array of the uh, cultural demographic of our city, um, are, uh, working day, night, weekend, whatever, in person, virtual, on the phone to address these exact issues that you're talking about. Yeah. However, I will say I would be, in, 
I'm happy to explore with your office a specific unit of folks, um, but we would want to be, uh, we'd want to, we'd want to look at like what it means to, you know, because I think you know there are, there are Polish immigrants, there are yeah, Irish it's immigrants, all it's, immigrants, right? Exactly, it's all immigrants, Russian, Brazilian. It, right, right. So what I would love, and because I, I definitely only have one more question here lined mm -hmm. up for you, um, is for uh, you all to consider doing a study and an audit of your services around immigrant supports and identifying how many immigrant-owned businesses are here in the city of Boston, what type of supports they need, and how your office is going to address those supports. Considering it with a um, baseline and a benchmark, mm -hmm. um, I think that that's definitely something that I'd like to see some investments in. And then I'm just gonna ask one more question, and I ask this because I know that back in February um, of 2021, BECMA, under your leadership, made a list of procurement demands, including immediately setting up spending goals of 15% for black-owned businesses, and it combined 40 for women and minority-owned businesses, right? And I'm curious about how this home rule petition's capacity, um, I believe there's also a home rule petition that we, um, you know, have filed, can do that. Is your mission, um, is your mission um, to get us to those spending goals that, and what are the tangible steps that you're taking to get us there? Mm -hmm. um, and I'll say I appreciate the recommendation you made in the previous question that you asked. So we're gonna look at the study audit. Um, so Beckman was a, a, a very uh, important experience uh, for me. And last year when we were focused on this issue, um, or I'll answer your question in this way. Absolutely, I'm committed to making sure that we are uh, surpassing the uh, aspirational goals that were put in the executive order last year of 25%, and then uh, setting what you just suggested, you know, through Beckman last year as new goals uh, to reach. But this is one reason why uh, that's what informed the ARPA request for the $10 million to help uh, grow the pipeline of businesses that are prepared to do the work, because what I don't want to have happen, and would have said this exact same thing sitting on the other side as president and CEO of BECMA, uh, was to set goals that we would not hit because we don't have Yeah, pipeline. so I, I would just recommend that as you start thinking about, uh, you know, just kind of the work scope that we include. I know you mentioned minority-owned, but I think that in terms of immigrant-owned, I think that we need to start really being super intentional with our language because a lot of businesses don't see themselves as black-owned or they don't, they don't understand the concept of minority. But when you're super intentional with your language, I think that people feel included in your efforts. Because right now, a lot of folks in the immigrant community do not see themselves reflected in the goals and objectives to help support immigrant-owned businesses here in the city of Boston. So I would recommend that you start really expanding your language so that it feels more inclusive. Um, and then I have a question for um, arts and culture. And then I'll wrap up. Um, you mentioned in your RFI um, that most of the artists and groups you work with do. Council uh, here. Oh, Council, this is a tourism. Arts and culture will be. Yeah, coming uh, up. oh. Yeah. They're. Okay, separate so we're doing things a little bit different. Okay, so we didn't go through all that. Okay, because I was late, so I wasn't sure if they had already gone. Yeah. It's all good. Don't worry. Okay. Um, uh, so then I have one more. So then um, just. Chief, I just think that it's it's really important as we continue to build relationships for, for us to recognize that we can only support you if we have a full understanding of what your capacity looks like, right? And if the community um, on the other side is saying that they're not, that your efforts are not reaching them, right? Then our job is to help connect those people to your office. But once they get connected, then there needs to be the infrastructure set up for them to go through the process from beginning to end in terms of setting up shop, right? Or dealing with a specific issue. And I think language is, yes, one of those biggest roadblocks, but I also think a level of understanding of what it's like to come to this country and try to set up shop, understanding the culture, understanding how to set up a business, understanding the business essentials, all of that is really important, and I really do believe that the budget needs to reflect that initiative in terms of immigrant-owned businesses. And you know, yo, yo no veo aquí a nadie que hable español tampoco. Ese es otro problema, right? Like, the, uh, aquí, aquí, aquí hablan alguien español? Un poquito. Un poquito. Sí. So I, I really do think in terms of leadership um, that we need to also be super intentional about making sure 
that the leadership also reflects the demographics of the city as well. And that is a commitment uh, absolutely on my end and will say as the son of an immigrant business owner uh, that I fully agree and we will uh, look forward to meeting with your office when available uh, to address some of the current concerns that you've raised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Mejia. Council Brayden. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and um, I apologize if I had an, another engagement out in the district, and here I am. Um, so I missed the presentation. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, and I don't have any, because I didn't hear the presentation, I don't, have, I don't have great questions, but I did want to follow up on Councillor Mejia's uh, comment about immigrant-owned businesses. I think um, your recent visit to our main streets in, in Brighton illustrated, and I think it goes across the board that um, the um, opportunity to make it in America, a lot of it, or anywhere, even in the, in, in the UK, where um, the immigrant experience of having their own business and and working all hours, um, all in f family, everybody's working. Um, it, it's a way to get a foothold and get established in a new country. And I think any support we can uh, give our immigrant um, businesses is really critical to help them thrive, get established and thrive in our neighborhoods. They work incredibly hard. And I was, in, I was, I was amazed at the number of immigrant businesses that we visited that day. Um, and then even the, the, the one, the, the family that were, the, the business that was celebrating 100 years, it, start, it was started by an immigrant 100 years ago, so it's still here. So that's, that's incredible. Um, the, uh, the, the issue, one issue I, I know we remarked on it when we were in Brighton Centre was the, there's a block of, um, across the street from where we were visiting, there's a, a block, uh, it's called, it it's includes uh, expiring use housing and it's got a, a, a ground floor row of, of small um, business units that are vacant and some of them have been vacant for four years at this point. Is there anything we can do to uh, incentivize uh, landlords to activate those those retail businesses um, or uh, on the other side of that does the carrot and the stick uh, penalize them for not activating um, it's or if if you know and, and then also we talked a, a little about acquisition and support for um, businesses um, acquiring their own premises if they're able to I know it's a very hot re real estate market at the minute but Owning your own owning your own space is, is just like owning your own home adds a lot of stability and predictability to your to your future. Mm -hmm. and those are really the two questions I had. So I appreciate that, and we're going to be looking forward to coming back out uh, to your district for these uh, tours later this summer. Um, I will still have on my suit just to let you know, um, no matter how hot it is. Um, so uh, on e you know even the specific example, um, the carrot and the stick. So. Uh, one item that the city council was exploring uh, under Matt O'Malley a couple years ago was a vacancy tax. And that if a landlord were to keep a uh, space, uh, you know, vacant for a period of time, uh, that they would begin to be assessed a fee uh, of whatever the council had decided. You know, uh, I think that is something worth us exploring, especially after we set up a rebate program that will address things like rent and other operating costs uh, for a business owner interested in filling some of these spaces. Um, so that's one piece. On the acquisition uh, piece, you know, we cannot use the operating budget uh, in that way, unfortunately. And believe me, we have tried to find every which way to identify funding to help on that. You know, we are exploring um, uh, funding from another source on the acquisition piece. Uh, but just to say that um, our small business team, though, is equipped uh, with the tools and resources as well as TA providers to work with uh, business owners to acquire uh, property. So these are some of the ways we're trying to tackle this, but uh, again, are always open to, to other ideas. Very good. Um, thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm a little at a loss because I haven't heard the presentation, but that's fine. I'm good for now. Thank you. I'll come back to you. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Council Braden. Um, okay. I, I have a few questions, and if I don't get through them, we'll come back to me because I like to time myself uh, the same so we can just keep the flow going. Mm -hmm. um, my first question, um, so in your mission statement, you 
mentioned um, that you seek to make Boston a global model of economic e equity. Can you describe what this looks like in the real world, um, specifically like concrete steps that you're making? And I know that I, I heard your presentation um, and these hearings are not fair because you don't really get to get, um, get really to, in the crux of things. But if you can break down to me in the real world, concrete mm -hmm. steps um, that you're gonna make to do that. Sure, um, and I, I will say that, uh, you know, again, it's a working definition because um, it's also too long of a mission statement. Um, no one's gonna ever memorize this. How <laughs> um, long is it? Uh, it's probably about seven pages. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, I will say that everything that flows after that statement is meant to be what the steps will be. Um, so if, if we look here, um, uh, practices that repair economic harm. So I mentioned uh, how we're gonna be focused on making sure that uh, resources are uh, equitably distributed with a focus on racial equity. So one of our steps is making sure that whether it's grant money um, or uh, services, et cetera, uh, that we are uh, uh, shifting those resources to communities that have needed it most for a long time and making sure it gets to where it needs to be. Building generational wealth, the steps that we just discussed here, whether it's getting a business in a storefront or helping business owners acquire property, helping with uh, uh, form co-ops, et cetera. Um, uh, so things like that. Um, uh, equitable procurement, so how the city is spending its own money. Um, that's gonna be an important way of putting money in the pockets of business owners and their employees, as we're seeing with City Fresh. Um, and then uh, one thing that I think is an update is our partnerships. Again, you know, I understand that when we're sitting here, we're talking about what we as a department or as a cabinet are gonna do, but I am very aware that government cannot do anything by itself uh, and that it will only be successful if it's working with other people. Um, and especially from you know, my previous role where you know, I developed many, many healthy relationships. Um, so you know, I know this is a long-winded answer, I apologize. Um, but you know, th these are a sum of the steps that we're uh, hoping to enact over just this year alone um, in order to build this global model of economic equity outlined in the first sentence. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so as part of your strategy, uh, you stated that you plan implementing sustainable practices and repair economic harm. Mm -hmm. I really wanna understand what the economic harm is. Mm -hmm. Can you can you elaborate? Sure. Well, and it depends on which community we're talking about. If we're talking about uh, the black community, which uh, I will use uh, that term to include the diaspora because you know, I know that there are different experiences based on where we might come from, but in this country, if your skin is black, you were treated uh, a particular way. They don't ask you what country you're from. Uh, you know, cop doesn't, well, let me not uh, do that. But I'll just say that we are not asked where we're from before people treat us like black people. Um, and so when we think about the economic harm, you know, some people will go all the way back uh, to 1600s, where Massachusetts becomes the first colony to legalize uh, the slave trade. Uh, and so the economic harm is the fact that black bodies were considered property and considered chattel. And so we're not able to be, to participate in the economic prosperity of this country. For other communities, uh, whether it be uh, Latino or Hispanic communities, um, Asian Amer American communities who come here and are uh, treated at a disadvantage because of the fact that they were born in a country other than America and are similarly not allowed to participate at full capacity in the economic prosperity uh, of this country and of this state. Um, so we come even although all the way up to present day where whether it's lending practices from our banks, whether it's redlining and where people are allowed to live and purchase homes uh, or, or rent, these are all different ways that have penalized people for not being white uh, in the country. Um, and so these are some examples of economic harm, but you know we can get even more granular, I'm sure, if we had more time. Do we have, and I'm, I'm sure you do, but do we have um, stats on that that, like that, that, like do we have that data? Do we have that study? Do we understand who is at the bottom and who is is most vulnerable and and, and so on and so so forth? Mm -hmm. We talked. I mean, I know that some of my colleagues talk about the immigrant population, uh, the non-English speaking or blacks, brown, BIPOC, all of these acronyms. They drive me nuts, right? Because I hate the fact that we have to dilute conversations in order to humanize black bodies. So I wonder, like, do we, what is informing your work? Mm -hmm. And then the other question is, 
how do you think systemic racism is structured to perpetuate that, the harm that you speak of? Yeah, so in terms of studies, you know, in Boston itself alone, we honestly could pave our streets with the number of studies that have been done on uh, our communities um, and you know, uh, you know why things are the way they are, or the lack of investment history, et cetera. Um, the most common, you know, referenced report, of course, is the color of wealth, which, as I mentioned last week, is something that is being reviewed, and uh, there's going to be a new report done to kind of. Uh, they don't like to call it an update, but there'll be another, a similar study. Um, and then a lot of our universities have produced uh, reports uh, related to this. The city of Boston, through the Boston Planning and Development Agency, puts out a series of reports each year on each uh, individual community. Um, I think the last study was called um, A Prosperous Boston for All. It was a community economic impact series. So there's a number of reports, yes, and a lot of our uh, work is based on what the city produces, but also um, uh, what universities uh, put out as well. And then based on our relationships with different community organizations um, as well. And then in terms of systemic racism, so, I mean, you know, the system is working as it was intended uh, currently, where um, impacted communities continue to not be able to uh, enjoy the full benefits of the economic prosperity of the country. And where, you know, the country uh, loves to um, uh, symbolism. That is the result of systemic racism, uh, especially in Boston, where we are focused on surface level and symbolic gestures rather than substantive measures to address uh, the real issue uh, at hand. Thank you. Do you have you instituted any policies to work on such systemic structures or oppressive structures here yeah. in your department or the city? So certainly uh, see that some of the uh, requests we're making as ways to begin to uh, push back uh, on systemic racism. But I will say that we did just hire our new director of policy to do exactly what you just mentioned, to help us think through um, what are the, and this is why this sustainable practices line is bolded and important. You know, I talk a lot about uh, whether it's in speeches or in conversation about the impact my grandfather had on me uh, and the, and not just the wisdom he left with me, but also what we were actually talking about in that moment when he said not to confuse motion with progress. It was the fact that 50 years ago, 1965, down the street, Boston Common, 40,000 people were marching. Well, what were they marching for? They were marching for better housing, marching for no police brutality, marching for access to better education, uh, access to spending business with black businesses. And we are here in 2022 talking about the same exact thing. And so what I've committed myself to is making sure that we are instituting sustainable practices, that 50 years from now, we are not talking about that whoever is sitting here, and hopefully it's not me, I don't want to be here 50 years, um, but you know, that 50 years from now, whoever is sitting uh, in this seat, or maybe we'll be hovering, I don't know, uh, is they're not talking about addressing these particular issues, but that there are new issues uh, that we're addressing, but that we have a more equitable world uh, at that time. Thank you. Do you feel you have su 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 sufficient um, funding? Whenever, so whenever I struggle with English, I have to like show off that English is my fourth language. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it didn't stop there, okay? Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, I, do you feel you have sufficient funding um, for, to, to build capacity in order for you to work on these things? Well, I see this year as our baseline year. And so I do believe that the budget we've submitted reflects uh, what we look forward to in this new year. This is a year of learning. For a lot of us, we're new to this role, new to being in city government. We're learning what the barriers are or what the challenges are, but also what the opportunities are. And so I would say, I believe what we've submitted is sufficient for this year, but we will certainly be sure to ask you for more money next year. <laughs> <laughs> I did notice um, 1,700, about 1,700 average. Um, what, that seems really low for personnel. 1,700. Is that a department history, in department history then 2023 recommended for personnel, serv oh, services, sorry, um, employee, yeah, it's still about 1,700. Is that, is that your budget? Sorry, I should ask. I don't, I don't have that in front of me, I'm okay. not sure. Okay, no worries. Um, I guess, how, how are you working with workforce development? 
view, you know, economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, what are your collaboration efforts? So uh, one of the first things we did was to make sure that when we launched our cabinet that OWD was included in that because workforce development is absolutely, uh, uh, it's as important, uh, it's part of economic development. We cannot have a healthy economy if we're not focused on training the future workforce. And so, Sorry, why isn't it under your department? So the budget is with the Boston Planning Development Agency. These are decisions that were made before any of us were here. I don't have an answer for why that is. But in terms of the cabinet, you know, first of all, Trent and I have worked together in prior roles. Uh, when Maduri was deputy chief, uh, excuse me, interim chief, uh, worked very closely with uh, Tren, and so there's always been a bond between the two, but it's never been on paper, from my understanding, I think, that this is the cabinet. I just wanna make sure, I have to keep, because I, you know, I need to make sure I'm it's right. It's not official. Right. All right. Right, but, but um, Tren is considered, and Tren as the representative of OWD is considered a member of our senior leadership team, uh, and is part of every strategic decision uh, that we make because whatever we do impacts her work and vice versa. Okay, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. If you have relationships and you're working closely to build that up. Um, for tourism, it's one of the largest uh, revenue drivers. Um, what, how is that supporting the racial equity, racial equity specifically? the money that comes in through the, tourism? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I guess I think of tourism mm -hmm. like the arts. So Boston is systemically and uh, traditionally, at least the Anglo culture dominates in mm -hmm. Boston. Mm -hmm. When you think about tourism, the tourist, the tourist attraction or whatever it happens in Boston is Anglo culture. It's not black culture, it's not black arts. But we, people of color and black people, dominate art. We are innovators and we have, there's so much available, so much rich art in Boston or so much that we could do to bring tourists to history, mm -hmm. like black history in Boston. Mm -hmm. Are we working on this? Um, and then how can we, black community or black and brown communities benefit from the tourist market outside of right. activating spaces mm -hmm. and events? So, so this is, I, I really appreciate that question. So um, we have our new name, right? Economic Opportunity and Inclusion and with the new name, which of course is more confusing for people to remember, um, comes also our new uh, vision or scope of work. And so there are four priority categories that we're focused on. I won't go through, you know, the, it's COVID recovery, shifting city investments, prosperity for all, but neighborhood revitalization is exactly what you're talking about. We cannot turn our neighborhoods into destinations if there are only four places that people are visiting when they visit the city, the Seaport, Faneuil Hall, uh, Copley area, um, and downtown. Like that's not, <laughs> that is not the city. And people are missing out on so much rich history, cultural vibrancy. I mean, this year we're celebrating uh, uh, the 150th of, um, of course, now that I mentioned what it is, I forgot the name of the gentleman. Anyway, but hugely influential uh, black leader um, who uh, uh, you know, wrote The Liberator, uh, the newspaper, lived in Hyde Park. No one's going out of the way, and I'm left alone in Hyde Park because no one wants to come over to Hyde Park because we're not marketing the different areas of the city in the same way that we do other places. If anyone's watching sports right now, uh, you know, when they're watching the finals or, or previously the playoffs, whenever they cut to commercial break and the games are happening in Boston, they don't go anywhere outside of the downtown area or uh, where, uh, wherever the, the sport is being played, right? We're not showcasing what we have to offer. One of the ways we've tried to address this is the all-inclusive campaign, uh, which has shifted all of that and has focused primarily on neighborhoods that have been ignored and are not marketed out there. Roxbury, Mattapan, Dorchester, et cetera, and not just lifting up through images and through um, commercials about these areas, but the website itself, directing people, directing traffic uh, to support our, our businesses, uh, particularly restaurants. Um, so these are some of the ways that were being worked on when I came into this role. And you know, it's always important for me to acknowledge work that was being done prior to, because we didn't come in and just do all these things in the last 150 days, as much as I would love to take credit for it, but you know, that's just not how it works. A lot of folks, Sarah, Midori, uh, uh, Amy, others have done incredible work. Um, 
but now what we're doing, and this is to uh, what President Flynn mentioned and Councilor Laurel, is taking a look at, um, you know, what are the conferences that we're attracting to Boston? Because right now, we're mostly reactive, right? People, people decide to come to Boston and then we prepare for that. But we want to be proactive. So this new director of tourism is going to essentially be an ambassador for the city, going out to attract the types of conferences that reflect broad areas of our community um, to ensure that when they do come here, we're then getting them to the different neighborhoods, but also that people want to become tourists of their own city. You know, there are people that grow up in Boston that have never been, like, I, when, when I was at Latin Academy, there were people that had never been to Charlestown, ever, um, and living in that part of Dorchester, which I thought was crazy. Um, but it's also possible, right? So we want to turn residents into tourists as well, not just about the money. Anyway, I apologize, but that, this is an ex exciting, passionate uh, I'm question. with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you're right. I think that when we're talking about undoing harm in Boston, there's opportunity to create cross-culture opportunities. There's opportunities for us to... Um, not only educate, but to give people more exposure mm -hmm. to the culture and uh, history of everything in Boston. Boston yeah. is super rich in terms of culture and history. Um, why not do it here in Boston? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I love that opportunity. And when we're talking about truth and reconciliation, there has to be spaces for reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And I see that cross-culture sort of tourism um, you know, intersectionality of, you know, black, white, whatever, festivals or whatever it is that you're, you, you are thinking about mm -hmm. um, as an opportunity for, for repair or for healing. Um, so I thank you for thinking that way. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your cannabis equity program? Um, how's it going so far? What stages are you on? And yeah, your plans. Sure, I think this, uh, Dory? Um, so you know, since the uh, Cannabis Equity Ordinance was established in 2019, you know, we've been working with the licensing board, Boston Cannabis License Board, that was established in 2020. Um, since then, we've hired two full-time staff members who are in the audience, but they had to go. Um, one is Cannabis uh, Equity Fund Manager and Cannabis uh, uh, Manager. Um, and we are, uh, the, the job of the two sort of team members are a uh, couple things. One is they certify uh, applicants as equity, right? So people who have been impacted by war on drugs um, that uh, can access uh, some of our resources that we have in our office. One of them is equity grants, uh, that we provide grants directly to these cannabis businesses. Uh, most of them use it for rent, uh, because as you know, uh, to open up a cannabis business is a very, very expensive endeavor. Not many banks, uh, any banks, uh, provide uh, assistance for it because it's not legal federally. Uh, so we're happy to be able to do that. Um, and then we also provide technical assistance uh, for cannabis equity <clears throat> applicants. Uh, so it's anything from going through the Boston Cannabis Board Commission, right, getting the presentation ready, getting a traffic study done, right, if the community is pushing back on the traffic study, uh, on, on the tra uh, expected traffic, uh, website development, uh, and all, all sorts of um, um, assistance. Um, so we're happy that we currently uh, have 45 equity applicants. Uh, 13 more in the queue, um, and our hope is that uh, many of them uh, will be uh, able to open up a shop uh, in uh, before the end of the year. Thank you so much. Um, that does away with two of my following questions. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, yes. Um, uh, so, in addition to the work of uh, the, on the storefront piece, you know, uh, Joe Gilmore, who's uh, the member of this team. I remember when I was at Beckman, he had this famous quote. Uh, when he was on the advocacy side where he would say, the people who made the most money during the gold rush were the folks that sold the picks and the axes. And, you know, so on this front, I'll just add that, you know, on this work we're doing with equi equity candidates on the storefront piece, there's also the work that the team is doing to help people explore other aspects of the cannabis industry. A lot of people just go to dispensary because that's what's out there. Um, but it's really important to always remind folks that there are all these other opportunities and ways to participate in the industry that are just as lucrative, uh, if not more, uh, uh, than a dispensary because of the prohibitive uh, costs. So, you know, we're proud of the work that's been done so far, but are also working to grow, uh, to make the industry equitable in all uh, parts of it, not just on the dispensary front. Thank you. Um, Chief Ortega and um you, you're welcome to sit here with us. I, those chairs are horrible. Um, 
and they hurt my back and my bum when I sit there. So I don't know <laughs> if you guys want to stay there, but you're welcome to join us. Um, thank you for adding that. Can you tell me a little bit about your um, small business development or in terms of Main Streets and what is going on with that? What, what are your plans with Main Streets? So uh, in the operating budget, we've made a request for a million dollars and last week in our ARPA request for $4 million. So this $5 million, if approved by the council, uh, would be the largest investment the city's ever made uh, in Main Streets. What we have proposed in working with the current Main Street's directors um, is that you know this would do a couple of things. One is it would increase the operating budget from $57,500 to $100,000, which means that Main Streets would be able to pay a, a better wage uh, to their um, uh, Main Street's directors um, and uh, potentially onboard other staff, which is important because even if you're paying one person more, you're still one person and can't do everything. Um, so there's that piece. Uh, the funding would also increase the programming budget from $17,500 to $25,000 to allow for more programming activities throughout the year. We're also gonna be though prioritizing collaboration between Main Streets, particularly those that are near one another so that we're not operating in silos. Um, and then finally adding a, a new line for beautification um, so that Main Streets could, uh, you know, whether it's trash cans or banners or flower pots or really however. We don't actually want to be the ones that just say, we don't want to be prescriptive. We want to give the opportunity to Main Street's directors and their boards to identify the best ways to utilize that money. Um, you know, all that said, this is part of a larger effort under the Reimagine Main Street's effort uh, to uh, consider what the future of Main Street's ought to be so that it's working for everybody. Um, you know, I mentioned at the hearing last week that we did not want to throw wood on a burning fire in terms of adding more Main Streets because, you know, even with this new, inf this new investment, um, Main Streets directors, I'm sure, you know, yourself uh, having served as one, um, would, uh, would, you know, agree that the current uh, makeup, the current model uh, uh, is not flaw-proof. Right, and so what we want to explore is how do we how do we enhance the uh, relationship between the city and the main streets? How do we help them achieve their objectives? How do we make sure our objectives are being achieved? Um, and then how do we ensure that other resources, whether it's through the foundation or other uh, places, are coming to main streets in an equitable way, um, so that not, we're not recreating this lopsided investment in some communities uh, and not in others. But it's a longer-term approach versus getting it all done this year. Okay. Well, congratulations on that. I, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, we know why uh, Main Streets is near and dear to uh, my chest, and I um, appreciate all the support that uh, they can get. Um, and th thank you, uh, Miss Amy, so much for Donna Summer. I look for forward to that. <laughs> I, I wasn't aware. And um, <coughs> disco is music to my ears, so <laughs> I look forward to that. Um, can you tell me, um, sorry, um, can you send me a breakdown of all of the events by neighborhood and how much you've spent on them or supported them in sure. tourism? Thank you. Um, and then I guess I would just say that I didn't see um, any Cape Verde, anything included? So this year we have added to our dance parties, we're gonna do a Kazumba um, dance party um, on the plaza. Uh, okay, um, thank you. So Kizomba, Angola, but I know that we dance it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, <laughs> that's, it's all good. Um, we love Kizomba, but if we, we're, so there's a Cape Verdean um, parade that is gonna is being is in planning, and would love to, some support on that. Would love to collaborate with you, um, and see how we can. Yes, I, I was just made aware of that. Um, I talked to Brianna just a few days ago, so yeah, happy to support and look forward to talking to you about it. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, I'm, I have a letter from my counselor colleague um, Aaron Murphy, and I'll give you guys a break from my questions <laughs> and um, I'll just read this into record ask her question uh, we may have a couple people on zoom 
Um, they may have left by now, but um, we'll go to that after. This is from Councillor Aaron Murphy, dear Madam Chair and member of Ways and Means. I am writing to inform you of my absence during today's City Council hearing on docket 0480-0486, FY23 budget, economic opportunity and inclusion, tourism, arts and culture, tourism and arts revolving funds, equity fund. I, a representative of my staff will be listening in and following up with me. I look forward to reviewing the footage and following up as need be. I regret that I could not stay the entire duration of the hearing, but I am submitting the following questions to be entered into record with the hopes to get getting a response from the administration either during or after the hearing. So she's asking, um, uh, she's saying that it's okay to email it um, if, that's, if that's what you prefer. According to question one, according to Boston Globe, to the Boston Globe in Boston, the medium net worth of black families is just $8. The COVID-19 pandemic has widened the racial gap, wealth gap even more. How are we developing pathways to overcome income and wealth disparity in the workforce? Question two, can you give more insight on how the department is implementing solutions that repair past economic harm while also preventing further economic harm, especially to disadvantaged communities? Um, please feel free to respond by email. It does sort of overlap with my questions and my colleagues. Um, sincerely, Councillor Aaron Murphy. Thank you. Um, we'll just check if we have any testimonies. Congratulations, uh, Alicia. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I know um, we haven't officially met, but I was um, very excited to hear about you coming on board. Thank you. I've heard uh, many great things about you. So oh, you great. <laughs> Sometimes seasonal. Thank you so much. Um, don't listen to them. <laughs> and Midori, if I have a daughter, I know, I, even in my 40s, I will name her Midori. I love your name. Oh, thank Absolutely you. Absolutely love your name. <laughs> I meant it the first time I told you that. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Very kind. I'll tell my parents. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, love what, it. What about my name, Counselor? I don't understand. <laughs> I have two sons already. Oh, well. <laughs> I definitely plan on having a daughter. <laughs> okay, thank you. Miss Laura is, um, Radwin is on, um, and Carrie stepped away from the screen. So we'll give her, we'll give him a couple seconds. Right on time. I'm not going to put you on the spot. Um, she, and Miss Miss Laura is a um, a fan of Ways and Means. Um, and yesterday I told the. Uh, and I'm in your pocket all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Laura, and by the way, my grandmother came to this country from Latvia, speaking nine languages. So there you go. Oh my goodness, she beat wow. me. Oh my goodness, so I'm impressed. Okay. Um, I am not worthy, Miss Miss Radwin. Um, Welcome. It's always lovely to have you. Can Thank you. you. Please uh, state your name for the record, introduce yourself, and uh, yeah. I'll give you three minutes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Laurel Radwin from Rosendale. Um, Ann Hernandez and I have submitted written testimony requesting that Main Street's programs uh, be contractually ob obligated to include those most affected when board members discuss plans with developers and Boston units such as the Transportation Department. And the testimony also speaks to contractual requirements for transparency and accountability. But your testimony prompted two requests. Pretty early in your tenure, likely when you were all very, very busy, we wrote to your office about inclusion and equity in one of Boston's tactical plazas, open space. Would it be possible to follow up with a conversation? And two, as a co-leader of the Rosendale Coalition, I've established very good relationships with Latin, oh, Latins, Latinx people who own barber and beauty shops. I would hope I could be included in your walking tour of Rosendale. And just to elaborate on our written testimony, in total there appears to be $5 million proposed for Main Street's program, as you said, but not all programs are equally inclusive, accountable, and transparent. 
And in terms of uh, discussions and uh, plans with developers and transportation department, I would like to see every Main Street conduct a thorough community inclusive check back tool before conversations with developers and city departments begin. And this would respect the small business owners and it would also help prevent gentrification. Again, uh, to our written testimony, it would be um, uh, in terms of transparency and accountability, could Main Street's programs uh, be required to provide public access to board meeting agenda, minutes, annual work goals and work plans, and good governance reports and other required documents that are in uh, contracts. Um, and also it would be um, important for inclusiveness and transparency to require access by community members, small business owners, to the board meetings. And this could be in person or in Zoom. And that ends my testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Radwin. Um, I have a letter also from Councillor Lu Jen um, that I'd like to read into record. And Councillor Braden, if, you're, um, if you have any questions, then we'll go to you next. Okay, thank you. Um, dear Committee on Ways and Means, I regret to inform you that I will be unable to attend today's budget hearing on the Office of Economic Opportunity Inclusion, Tourism, Arts, and Culture. First, I want to express full support for the Office of Arts and Culture and the Office of Tourism, Sports, and Entertainment. My first job as, was as a local youth tour guide, and I am keenly interested in how we elevate the diverse history of our neighborhoods and residents and tourists alike. Second, I am excited to see significant investments in the Office of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion. However, I continue to have general concerns about how we are supporting new BIPOC businesses with capital assets. I will thoroughly review the video, hearing minutes, and public testimony and follow up with the department heads and chiefs. Should you or any member of the public have any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out to my office directly at 617-635-4376 or at ruthzee, r-u-t-h-z-e-e -E dot l-o-u-i-j-e-u-n-e -E -E at boston.gov. Sincerely, Ruzi Lujan. Um, Council Braden, did you have um, any further questions for the panelists? Okay, thank you. Um, I have more um, questions, but I know that we are reaching 12 o'clock. Um, I think I can submit them by email, um, and if we can get that. I look forward to working with your department. I'm super impressed by the diversity, um, how you, you as a department um, or cabinet are um, show like really good energy. Mm -hmm. I don't have another way, a fancy way of putting that. Um, and I just, and it shows. It shows that there's synergy. It shows that you are working like really well together. And this is uh, probably one of, I would say, um, the top, um, I don't want, never mind. I don't want to put anybody out there. But um, you're just, you, it shows. And I, I congratulate you for doing um, such an amazing work for your innovative vision, uh, Midori, for your, humility and um, hard work and holding us down um, to, to, to now. And Alicia, congratulations. Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry, um, Miss? Sarah. Sarah, sorry, Sarah. Um, and, and I look forward to working with you. Any further questions, we'll submit them. If you have any closing statements, I would like to hear them now before I dis we dismiss you. Well, I think I would just, well, I appreciate uh, the kind words, Councillor, and just want to thank uh, you uh, and the leadership and stewardship of this committee, um, and want to thank your council colleagues as well for the ideas and solutions and recommendations that have been suggested to us. You know, all of us are committed to being better and improving what we're doing, and so, um, you know, these have been really, really important um, and uh, great exercises in, or thought exercises, I would say, in uh, kind of exploring you know, how we can do better. So just appreciate the opportunity and we will look forward to 
all of the many meetings that we're going to have uh, to, you know, put together how we're going to impact our community. Yeah, just such a every Friday for me, I need a lot of time. <laughs> okay. um, I'm, I apologize, but I've been informed that we have one more um, testimony. Thank you. Brendan. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll be exceedingly brief because I have a six-month-old bouncing at my feet who might uh, decide <laughs> that it's, it's time to go for a walk. Um, uh, I, I'd like to uh, uh, talk a bit about Main Street's funding. Really excited to, to be here. My name is Brendan Fogarty, and I serve as a member of the board at Rosendale Village Main Street, or RVMS. Uh, the all-volunteer board of RVMS really applauds the leadership of the mayor and the Department of Economic Opportunity uh, in proposing a bold expansion of the city's investment in main, main Street's districts. Uh, the suggested increase in operated funding uh, uh, embodied in docket uh, 0480, as well as the proposed reimagined Main Street initiative, uh, these both reflect a really strong conviction that community-minded commerce will drive success in our neighborhoods. Uh, Main Street districts uh, sit at the nexus between diverse local entrepreneurs, community volunteers, and partners in the civic, nonprofit, and, and government communities at, at, at all levels, really. Our, our organizations, the districts themselves, underwrite community development with limited staff and, and as many of you know, uh, many, many volunteer hours from engaged neighbors. Uh, with this new support proposed for fiscal 23, Main Street's districts would better attract and retain uh, top-tier staff, which is a huge priority in the current labor market, uh, uh, expand and, uh, and really uh, 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 improve our local business support system, uh, increase our capacity to improve the visual appeal of our neighborhoods, and, and really create jobs where they're most needed in the heart of our communities, you know, sometimes very far from downtown, uh, creating a, 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 a vibrant network of, of community centers. So uh, in, in, in summarizing here, the members of uh, the RVMS board really thank the Committee on Ways and Means for its past commitment to small businesses and community success. And we look forward to working with the city council, the mayor's office, and all city departments on building strong and equitable communities together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brendan, for your insightful uh, testimony. And uh, my regards to your six-month-old. Enjoy your time, your walk. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I'm sorry. Can I, am I? Carrie, you don't want me to talk anymore? Uh, sorry, did anyone else have any statements? Okay. Okay, all right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, good afternoon. Same um, for you have, uh, how many minutes do you think you need for your presentation? Okay. All right, uh, no need to time that. Um, <laughs> please, you have the floor. And do we have slides? Carrie, if we can get the slides for arts and culture. Great, all right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's good to see you, and um, I'll reintroduce myself. I'm Cara Elliott Ortega. I'm the Chief of Arts and Culture, um, and I'm here with my colleague, Nida Faria. Um, Nida Faria, Director of Administration and Finance. Okay. 
Um, so the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, um, I'm going to give just a quick overview of what we have been up to in FY22 and some of our investments. And um, because there have been departments and cabinets shifting, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture is the office, the only office inside of the Arts and Culture Cabinet currently. So I'm the Chief of Arts and Culture, but I'm also the Director of the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, just to make that clear. Um, our mission is to create a thriving and welcoming city with equitable access to arts and culture in every community. And we do this in uh, four different ways. Go to the next slide. Um, by developing cultural programs and strategies, working across the cultural sector to respond to the needs of the city, working deeply with communities, and developing and sharing knowledge and resources. Uh, a thriving creative sector, and I mentioned this um, last week in the ARPA hearings, is a requirement for Boston's recovery as a city, both economically when it comes to tourism, taxes, and jobs, as well as for our well-being. Um, and if we can go ahead a couple of slides. Sorry, do you have a remote there? Or is somewhere? that for me? Oh, that's for me. Um, I'm going to start with the creative economy and how we serve creative workers. Um, serving the people who make creative work is a core part of what we do. This includes grants, contracts, and support for creatives, artists, cultural workers, and cultural organizers. And our support addresses a range of needs from startup capital for making new creative work, to help selling cultural products, to grants that help bring free cultural events to communities. So in FY22, we had over 400 applications for the Opportunity Fund geared towards individuals, and we awarded $800,000 to artists with a priority on populations impacted by COVID-19. And we're about to award a half a million dollars in contracts with service providers who can provide subsidized space, business workshops, and other professional development services. Um, and just to share some of the statistics about um, how that grant did as we targeted specific communities um, using public health data, 77.5% of grantees lived in our priority neighborhoods of East Boston, Mattapan, Dorchester, and Hyde Park. 86.6% of the events and programs supported by the Opportunity Fund take place in one of those neighborhoods, and 76.7% .7 of grantees identify as people of color, and 61.8% have an annual income of less than $25,000. And this is just a quote from someone who accessed services through a partner that we've been working with for a few years now, Assets for Artists. Um, and as we get more experience um, doing these kinds of services and tailoring them to where we see need um, throughout the city, um, we're getting better at making sure that that is actually um, meeting people uh, who we're trying to reach. Um, and so we're really excited with this next round of contracts um, providing professional development services that um, we're looking at, for example, how to make sure a whole subset of that is provided um, completely in Spanish um, for Spanish-speaking populations. We also have two more intensive programs um, featuring individual artists where we really champion the role of artists and cultural workers in leading change in our city, um, really underscoring the core belief that creativity is a requirement for making a better city and imagining new policies. Um, and those programs are the Artists in Residence Program and the Radical Imagination for Racial Justice Program, which is done in partnership with Massachusetts College of Art and Design. So the first puts artists in collaboration with city staff and departments to help us all think about how we can take new approaches um, to serving communities. And the Radical Imagination Program funds artists to imagine uh, and pilot racially just futures in partnership with their communities, however they might define that. And these are our um, current group of amazingly talented artists for FY23 who are working alongside um, various departments in the city, the Boston Planning and Development Agency Research Division, um, the BPA Planning Division, Parks, Environment, Transportation, as well as with our own office in Arts and Culture. In addition to supporting uh, the people behind cultural work, we also support the groups and organizations that produce and present cultural work. Festivals, performing arts, arts education, creative youth development, community arts experiences, and community cultural spaces. This year, with additional federal funds, we were able to award $3.4 million in grants through the Boston Cultural Council, which is one of two commissions that we staff, the other being the Boston Art Commission. And this is another program where we've worked to embed equity, focusing on smaller organizations that have no other regular source of funding in the city of Boston. And that's specifically looking at um, the landscape of philanthropy and where cultural organizations can get support in the city. We made 192 grants um, this year. 
This isn't just about resourcing, but also about partnering and convening leaders in the arts and cultural sector, in particular around how we can better serve all Bostonians. So a part of um, where we see our work growing is making sure that uh, leaders in the city, different arts and culture organizations, including our, our major institutions, really understand the demographics of who is here um, and how to actually make sure that their work is tailored to working with um, those communities uh, in a, a deep long-term way. A lot of the work that we want to expand in FY23 is cultural planning. Um, and I know Councillor Braden and I have been in a lot of these conversations. Um, we're actively reviewing around 40 to 50 development projects at a staff level. We're connecting with around five to six cultural districts at various stages of development. And we're supporting a pipeline of almost 300 artists, um, affordable artists live work units, and a number of cultural spaces that are set to be delivered by private development. We're doing that with one staff person right now, um, and so really having to pick and choose how we support this area of work, which I would say is probably our number one priority, um, just based on what we're hearing from artists um, and, and local creatives. So you'll see that this is our main area of investment. Um, a little additional context on why we're talking about cultural planning. Um, we've lost whole buildings full of artists um, and creative small businesses hundreds of thousands of square feet of space for people to make creative work in the city of Boston. And we're hearing, as I just mentioned, from artists and creatives um, every day, every week, who are trying to figure out what can they do about this and what can the city do about this. So if we really want to be a competitive place for people to want to live, if we want residents to have a market to grow their businesses, um, then this really needs to be addressed. We are able to pilot some successes, um, like with Humphrey Street Studios in Dorchester, um, thanks in partnership to other departments in City Hall, um, and also I think some, some sheer gumption on the part of city staff and local artists who really got together to try to organize around saving that building. But right now those are still kind of unicorn occurrences. So we still need to do a lot of work to develop the policies and resources to um, really have a pipeline to save these spaces and also create new ones. In addition to putting more resources towards this with our FY23 staffing request, we'll also be making um, funding and technical assistance available specifically on facilities and how to operate um, and gain control of physical space. Um, and that we'll do that through our operating budget. So we are looking at rearranging some of our current programs to be able to prioritize that. We continue to support uh, public art around the city, including upping the number of painted utility boxes, um, supporting 40 temporary artwork and mural projects around the city in FY22, and continuing to expand the Percent for Art program that supports long-term public art as a part of city facility projects. In particular, uh, we've been really excited to bring these artworks even more directly into city services by working with the BHA to host murals, BPHC and Recovery Services with several murals at the Engagement Center, uh, working with parks, and continued partnership with the library. In FY22, we also had active public art projects in every council district in the city. Lastly, I want to touch on programs that really foster engagement and access with the arts, the Poet Laureate, City Hall Galleries, and the Strand Theater. Um, under the guidance of our Poet Laureate, Portia Laiwola, um, there have been many, many more opportunities for the public to engage with poetry and the arts, um, including through workshops and public readings. We also named our second Youth Poet Laureate this year, who's already in very high demand. We also held over 50 exhibitions in the City Hall galleries, and we're on our way to being um, booked in City Hall for the rest of the calendar year. This year, the Strand uh, really saw the extremes of COVID-19's impact on the performing arts. We had cancellations, um, regular renters who really didn't know how um, their shows were gonna perform, how ticket sales were gonna do, um, how COVID policies would feel for audiences, whether they would have enough technical staff to even produce shows. And then somehow at the same time, we had the most people in and out of the building on a daily basis with the Van Gogh immersive experience, which was a major commercial rental for us. Uh, we've always known that there's a need for the space, um, a need sometimes for 1,400 seats, um, but we got a glimpse this year of that commercial viability of the theater and the need to revamp um, some of our operating practices, which we're gonna start to do this summer. Um, also, the potential for an operating model that can balance commercial renter, uh, rentals with community serving programs. So this is really a moment to push the theater forward, I think, even under the city's stewardship and actually double down on the city investment in the space. There are capital needs projects moving ahead in FY23 and we'll be putting aside strand programming dollars to conduct a market assessment to help us understand that commercial viability question. 
and we're offering grants to producers who need some help bringing their programs into the space. So throughout all of that also, the theater is still rented for about two thirds of the year. Um, so there are people coming and going from the theater and it is active. Um, and we're all in on these, these next steps to support the theater. And now I'll pass it over to Nida to talk specifically about our FY23 investments. Thank you. As Kara mentioned, we have two staffing requests related to adding capacity for cultural planning. The development review project manager will provide dedicated staff to engage in and direct development pipeline in Boston to better support and sustain our cultural and creative industries. The community engagement project manager will ensure that we that we are working in partnership with advocate spaces, cultural district at grassroots level, so that cultural planning work is really informed by and connected to specific needs in the community. We also have a staffing position at, for the City Hall Plaza, which is now being called the City Hall Plaza Engagement Manager. This position was designed in collaboration with Property Management Office of Economic Opportunity Inclusion to help market and program the plaza when it reopens. The renovations will create many more spaces for programs from markets to festivals to temporary art, and this position will be responsible for contracting and supporting programming at this, in this line, a vision of the City Hall Plaza has a truly civic space that is welcoming to all. Lastly, our capital uh, budget request supports continuation of the percent for art um, programs. Um, signage for public art and has well several community-driven projects like the Chinatown Worker Statues. And with that, um, we are happy to have conversation and questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Graven, you have the floor. Thank you. Got you all to myself this afternoon. <laughs> Isn't it uh, lovely? Mm -hmm. I think you and I have, you and I are hot to trot when it comes to arts districts in our neighborhoods. And it's you're a Capricorn thing. It's, oh, you're a Capricorn, I didn't yes. realize. That explains <laughs> everything. Okay, um, thank you so much, Cara. And I've forgotten your name again. Nida. Nida, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate all the great partnership we've had with your, you this year, uh, Cara, um, trying to navigate the, the challenges of trying to preserve um, and enhance our arts district and our arts community at the, in the face of so much development. Um, there was a couple of things. Um, the, um, the, works, the, the live workspace that many of our developers are coming in, it's, it's hailed as being a community benefit, but um, we sometimes discover after the fact that it really isn't designed, the space isn't, the specs aren't right, the, the space isn't specifically designed. So is there any way we can improve communication with BPDA and the developers to say, you know, a, a live workspace for an artist is just not a regular it's not in a regular apartment that there's certain features that we, we would, would like to see. Um, and then also, I know we've got a new chief of planning and I will be resurrecting and, and pushing the idea of trying to get a designated arts overlay district in Alston Brighton to try and um, you know, preserve some of the architectural features of the neighborhood, but also that sort of the, the energy and the, the, the vibe of, of say that um, Harvard Ave corridor across mm -hmm. through and intersecting with Brighton, Brighton, uh, Brighton Ave. And you know, just um, that's another thing I'd love to have your input on. And then also uh, we have a lot of, not a lot, we have some existing street art murals and et cetera that need a little disrep uh, they're in a little disrepair. Do we have funding or um, ways to um, do a little refurbishment on those uh, sort of art? You know, there's a few that I've seen that are probably been there for 20 years or more. They're, they're looking a little in need of some TLC. Yeah, thanks for those questions. Um, on the live work units, um, we spent time um, about two years ago now creating uh, guidelines, design guidelines specifically for artists live work units and artist spaces really geared towards this question because I know we were seeing the same thing. Um, so we've just had about a year of really trying to put them into practice um, and been working with the BPDA development review on making sure that that's provided upfront to any developers who are thinking about artist live work space. Um, and I think that we are getting better results uh, using that. We are seeing people actually coming into meetings with us, having already looked through those guidelines and talking about how they're gonna meet 
the different needs. Um, so I think that that's working. Um, now that we've been through a year of it, though, we will be looking at it and seeing if there's places where it's still falling short. And it is a challenge because the units, a lot of those units haven't been delivered yet, yet, right? Yeah. So it's, it's also a matter of kind of compliance, um, which I think speaks to the need of having uh, a development review position um, because it really requires us being involved throughout those meetings as they continue. It can't just be kind of a, a one and done conversation with us and then you know so many design decisions are made and we don't see it until it's too far along. So I think having that extra capacity will also help with that. Um, in terms of the, we have a new chief of planning. Um, so that's super exciting for us. I think um, really looking forward to collaborating with, with planning and development review and um, whatever direction it's, it's going and making sure that um, that cultural planning generally is really integrated into the work of both. Um, I think for us, we, would, we think that culture is already present in everything that we do, and so we might as well acknowledge it, and that by doing that, we're gonna have better results um, that are more kind of human-centered. Um, specifically with cultural districts, I think there's a lot of opportunity to talk about what zoning actually looks like for cultural districts citywide. Um, I think you know, this is a great time, um, good inflection point to, to bring that conversation. Yeah, so um, we'll be, with additional capacity, also we'll have more room to actually develop some of these policies and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can look at what other cities are doing and kind of what's available through zoning language. We know that there's some also low hanging fruit, like making sure that if you're in a cultural district, you can actually do cultural activities as of right, which right now isn't true in, in some of the zoning. So um, we'll start articulating what that looks like. Yeah. Um, murals in disrepair, we do have funding um, on the operating budget to do conservation for public artworks. And the reason that that's important that that's on the operating budget is that the percent for art programs since it comes out of capital is a little bit more restrictive. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it would be great to chat about which ones you're seeing that need help. Yeah. Um, and we can kind of get those into the rotation of um, having uh, conservation steps taken. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, and then the other issue um, is, do you have, or is there a relationship with Boston Public Schools? Because um, I think um, we have a whole generation of young people who are Arts education is always something that we're trying to get more funding for and make sure, but one of the most impressive um, art exhibits I've seen in the neighborhood in the last 10 years was um, a pro um, an exhibit put on by the senior class, graduating class from Brighton High School a few years ago, and the quality of the artwork and their stories and the diversity of the students, and it was just so impressive, and I think, um, they're, they're maybe our future artists and, and having them be engaged in this conversation is, is really important. Um, and then also the other issue I wanted to mention was, you know, the, we have the new Roadrunner facility a venue in, opened up now in, 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 on Guest Street, but it's a, it's a 3,000 seat people space. Um, it holds a lot of people and it's by all accounts it's going really well. Um, but it's those smaller um, performance spaces. And I, I had a conversation with um, Chief Idowell just a few minutes ago about you know, vacant shop fronts and um, how to yeah. revitalize those. Is there ways that we can explore um, you know, developing pop-up spaces for arts in vacant shop fronts in our Main Streets districts? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great suggestion. Um, there are a lot of areas of partnership, I think, with, um, with the Chief's um, areas of work. Main Streets is definitely one of them that we're looking forward to. Um, as we carve out more funding support from our operating budget, specifically for cultural facilities, I think that that's also gonna be really helpful. We know from helping people do pop-ups that there are some hurdles in terms of um, you know, having occupancy that you need and making sure that you can get an architect to update drawings and go through that whole process. And so I think there's a lot of technical assistance support and maybe fit out support that we could bring to the table to um, see if we can do that. Um, it also really falls into um, something that we've been talking a lot about, which is you know now that we're coming out of um, COVID-19 and kind of looking at our strategic priorities again and seeing where the gaps are kind of in this new reality, um, one of the areas of focus is making sure that there are accessible arts experiences in every community, um, whether that's you know, leveraging city-owned buildings like BCYF centers or libraries, 
or um, working with main streets and kind of activating spaces. We want to make sure that there are those accessible opportunities everywhere. Uh, and so I think we'll be able to actually bring some support to that this year. So in, in terms of, I know we've talked a lot about Alston Brighton. I know we did, you did the um, Civic Moxie folks yeah. did, a, did a, a review of our basically an asset inventory sort of thing. In terms of you know, just thinking about my district, our district, Alston Brighton, um, where, where do you think we should be going? Like this is an aspirational thing, like what's, we seem to be just kicking all the doors at the moment, and, yeah. and I'm hopeful that with a new administration and a new chief of planning that we can actually make some headway, but in terms of prioritizing where we should be putting our energies, what do you think we should be doing? Yeah, I mean, I think the zoning, um, cultural overlay, however we want to define that is really important um, because we're kind of at a point where there's been a lot of loss and a lot of things have already been approved in the development pipeline. Yeah. So I think there is a clarity that we need to have of this is really the area, you know, this is whether it's doubling down on the main street or looking at the Western Ave zoning saying this is really where we're going to be making these investments. Um, we've also been moving towards um, having one fund for the mitigation that is coming out of those projects so that we have more financial support to throw behind kind of a single effort. And I think that's that's what we need to do. As you say, we're kicking in all the doors, mm -hmm. um, but we need to kind of pick one area or one project and really um, double down on it with the funds that we do have and the staffing that we have. So I think that's the direction that we're moving in. Um, you know, we'll definitely be continuing to be in the conversations around the Western Ave zoning as well. Um, and I did want to just mention with BPS, um, so we're, we work really regularly with the um, director of arts at BPS, um, with Ed Vesters, and then we really sit in this space where we support the teachers and providers and organizations that then bring arts education into BPS. So we um, kind of helped found and support the Boston Area Network of Teaching Artists. We support the creative youth development organizations, some of which are the primary providers in BPS of arts education. Um, and so we play that role kind of in the infrastructure, um, but I think really looking forward to how we can work more with BPS in directly serving young people. So we're kind of the, like, indirectly doing that now, um, but would like to be much more involved on the ground so that we can also start to address um, something that we've been circling for a while, which is the kind of pathways in creative industries or kind of career connected learning that young people could be doing so that a young person who goes from, you know, being in a gallery show, um, you know, at the school mm -hmm. can really like have a path to exploring what that might look like mm -hmm. as a full time career, even if that's not as an artist, but, you know, having some sort of a role in a creative industry I mean, really seeing the spectrum of what's there. Roadrunner is a really interesting example because there are like 50 different kinds of jobs <laughs> that are happening yes. in that space, right? Yeah. From hospitality to, um, you lighting know, dealing with, and right, lighting and sound and tech. Um, and so how can we make sure if that's something that's happening in your backyard, that you as a young person can see that and kind of directly experience all of what might be available to you? Yeah. The other, one more question, Madam Chair, if I can, one more. Um, you know, the libraries have been moved, I've, they've been moved under a different cabinet position. Um, yeah. And I always think of the libraries as being centers of arts and culture. So, uh, and, it's, and I don't disagree that they have a huge impact in, in sort of the human services side of things. Um, I, 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 how is the relationship with your, your department going to change or will it be pretty much the same? With no, the we're always going to be like very working closely with the libraries. Um, that's not going to change just because they're sitting in another cabinet. Um, so I think, you know, if anything, the only difference is that as we're having this conversation about leveraging city assets, we'll be thinking about um, and working collaboratively with human services across various departments, including the libraries, right? So it's libraries, it's BCYFs, it's you know, uh, making sure that then we're partnering with BPS when there are BPS facilities that are involved. Um, so I don't think it, it will change anything about how we work with, with BPL. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for your work. It's it definitely a very, very important Thanks. piece of what it is to be in Boston. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Braden. Um, there's a statement that I read um, that the role of arts in all aspects are of 
all life in, in Boston is reinforced by equitable access to arts and culture in every community. Can you describe your work or um, can you describe your work in this regard? I'm sorry, in the regard of? In, in your, of your uh, statement, I think it was online, um, the role of the arts in all aspects of all life in Boston is reinforced via equitable access to arts and culture in every community. Yeah, so I think this relates a little bit to what I was just saying about um, really doubling down on making sure that no matter where you are in Boston, you have a space to um, both kind of consume arts and culture, but also be creative. Um, right now, we've lost a lot of those spaces. I think there is also kind of a scale of funding that's required in order to make that available and kind of a scale of coordination across different city departments. Um, so we think this is really uh, the, the opportunity to do that. Um, but I think this also goes back to some of our kind of core beliefs about uh, culture and creativity being a part of everyday life and that when we try to separate that out, that's actually a pretty artificial um, uh, even like Western European way of thinking about arts and culture. And so I'm really wanting to make sure that we're integrating arts and culture into everything that we do, not just looking at how people can access it across the city geographically, but this is part of why we think having um, creatives kind of even in city government is really helpful to make sure that we're bringing that perspective back in and we're thinking about how anybody accessing city services or hearing about city policies sees themselves kind of as a whole person and a whole community really represented in what we do. Um, and I'm not sure if that exactly answers your question. Yeah, no, I like that you um, have this holistic perspective of arts and culture in terms of it's part of your health, it's part of your living. Yeah. Um, I wonder how this rhetoric has translated into action. Yeah, I mean, I think one, um, one place in particular where it's translated into action is how we think about supporting the people who are making the work. So um, the contracts that we're um, about to award, one of the important parts of that scope of work that we heard directly from creatives was the need for you know, mental health support, um, uh, support thinking about um, the kind of social outcomes of arts and culture as a part of their work as practitioners. Um, creating space for healing um, for BIPOC identified artists as a part of professional development support. Um, and so we've worked that into that contract um, and that will be a part of then what we put back into the ecosystem um, by way of supporting uh, artists, consultants, groups that can provide that to, to fellow artists. So really looking at that peer-to-peer -peer support in that space. Um, so I think that that's kind of one approach to that. Um, the other is that as we think about access, um, and this goes back to how we might use the ARPA funds um, if those move forward as proposed, is to really prioritize working with BIPOC organizations that are serving BIPOC communities, but also immigrant organizations that are serving immigrant communities and trying to, um, I think, undo some of that kind of false separating of capital arts, capital A arts, from the kind of everyday lived experience and cultures that are in the city. So how are we making sure that we're actually bringing those together and we're contracting them together and supporting them together as a part of the future of, of how we think about culture in the city of Boston? Whenever I hear um, the acronym BIPOC, it feels as though we're not addressing racial equity, as though we're clumping a bunch of people together and then there's white and then BIPOC, right? And that seems unfair, right? Um, it, it seems inequitable almost. And so I wonder, what metrics do we use within that acronym mm -hmm. in order to prioritize the most vulnerable? Yeah, and I think when we say BIPOC, um, we try to do that very intentionally. So um, we've also heard, for example, from um, indigenous communities that the I in BIPOC is silent. And so when we say BIPOC, it's because we are thinking about different um, demographics that do show up in the acronym. And then we try to be really specific when something is about racial equity. Um, and even specific within racial equity um, to think about, for example, a conversation that's been happening in another space that we support, whether that is racial equity or it's um, racial justice or it's intersectional racial justice has also been a term that, um, that we've uh, been in conversation around as a way to actually acknowledge some of the other intersections with um, 
you know, whether it's um, you know trans women of color or it's indigenous and black identified people trying to be really specific about what those overlaps are and how we're addressing that um, and not, not doing what you're saying, which is lumping people into one category. Um, so right now across all of our applications and processes, we have a standard set of demographic questions that we use so that we can actually compare across everything that we're doing where money is going out. Um, I think uh, we're very willing and excited to think about what that looks like under ARPA with the restrictions that ARPA has um, so that we can say across the board, you know, where is the funding reaching, who's being contracted, um, and we're also very aware of some of the challenges with reporting that out. A lot of the individuals we work with aren't um, certified as women or minority-owned businesses. Um, and so even though we can look at our numbers and say, you know, 58% of our contracting dollars are going to um, contractors who could qualify, it doesn't mean that they're actually certified as such. So we're very much in the weeds on um, what those metrics are and who we're reaching and how. I think, in my observation, I think you do an excellent job. Administratively and just execution, I think, I think you're very good at your job. And I, I appreciate you and your department for the work that you do. I wonder, though, I mean, I, and, I, and I know that you will agree with me, um, but looking at the demographics of your top paid earners as well as the demographics of your employees overall, it's majority white, mm -hmm. and then your top paid is um, also majority white, but then Latino, and then one black person. And so I, there's the conversation on race, and every time I bring it up, it's uncomfortable for some people that um, have good intentions and want to be perceived for their intention, for what they hold true to their heart, and then it's, not it's it and then it can be also not so uncomfortable for people who don't care about it because they'll mm -hmm. just dismiss it so i appreciate that i can talk to you in this way and that even if it sounds like a broken record that you will entertain the conversation about racial equity that leads me to think to feel or to to ask you how do you feel that a majority white department can actually execute for, for racial equity in black arts? Yeah, I don't think that they can. I mean, I think the reality is that the demographics of the office have to be reflective of the communities that we're serving. I mean, I think that we try to be very thoughtful about um, where we're centering ourselves or not um, and what the power dynamics are of that, especially when it comes to grants. And we're in pretty deep conversations with um, the people who we're working with uh, about how we go about doing that and trying to be very thoughtful. Um, the Radical Imagination for Racial Justice grant, I think, is a really good example uh, where that was an entirely, um, entirely designed by um, women of color and then um, specifically handing over a lot of the program design, the language choices, even the eligibility requirements to um, an entirely BIPOC-identified um, advisory group as well as young people um, to really design that and really um, just hand over a lot of that kind of power. So I think that there's a piece of power sharing and um, that's really, really important um, to analyze and to have active conversations about as we at a staff level are administering um, these different programs. But that said, I do think that the demographics have to be um, reflective of, of who we're serving. So. Um, with these new positions, but also I think with a lot of turnover and vacant positions, we're definitely prioritizing that and thinking about um, how we can show up in a way that reflects all of the city of Boston. I don't know, Matt, if you wanted to, do you want to add to that from the HR? Um, sure. Um, I think one example would be our director of grants and programs, um, which is open right now. I'm working with um, reaching out to the community college. I had reached out to Munker Hill. It's up on different websites, so we're making sure that um, it's reaching the people that we want to reach out that reflects that community. Thank you. Um, do you would you mind sending me the breakdown of the grants that you've sent that mm -hmm. you've actually uh, given out and. Um, if you can't do it by neighborhood demographics, it's fine. And then just looking at, and, 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 I, and I, this is not to 
um, evaluate ARPA requests or budget requests in any way. This is just to a point of reference for the following year, just so that mm -hmm. we're really intentional about um, how we're making progress. You mentioned, um, a, or I, I had a question in the COVID recovery hearing about dashboards and being yeah. transparent as we are, you know, giving out grants or contracts. And I understand your issue or uh, challenge with documenting registered, you know, certified um, women-owned businesses or uh, people of color. Um, I, can you tell me a little bit about the dashboard and what does it actually do? What does it actually provide? Or if, you, if this is a future plan or if it exists now? Um, we don't have a dashboard now. Um, I think, you know, what, I'm, what I want to make sure is clear is that we would be happy to contribute to one. Um, and that we already have that data kind of collected as a matter of routine in our office. Um, I think we have most of it. We'll have to see kind of what other requirements ARPA brings that we might have to report on. Um, but no, I think it's just that we have the, the willingness to participate in that um, and think that it's important to do. Thank you. Um, a lot of people in communities of color either contact me or because I come from um, you know, doing events and art stuff, um, say that arts and culture as a department is not very accessible uh, from a you know people of color standpoint and I wonder what because I I was able to access you right I was mm -hmm. able to get a meeting with you and you're cheap like you're the top so I don't for me I I wonder then is it because I knew how or what was the issue um, and how do you find that and how are you connecting with community yeah, I think um, we pride ourselves on being really accessible. Um, so I think, you know, hopefully if um, for anyone who's listening, you know, they should feel like they can contact us. We also have um, a member of staff who has open office hours that anyone can sign up for, um, and that's available on the website. Um, and so the point of that is to be 100% accessible to anyone who has any questions, even if they're not in our office. Um, but any kind of creative person who's trying to figure out how to do something or where to go that you can um, just reach out to us or sign up for office hours and we'll help you with that. Um, so our hope is that we're, we're super accessible. Um, and I think that's a part of the um, kind of culture that we, we want to create and make sure City Hall has a reputation for. Um, I think also it has been really challenging during um, COVID and events not happening in person and lockdown. And I think this relates to personnel as well. You know, nobody gets into arts and culture to sit behind a desk all the time and look at spreadsheets. Um, and it's actually been, you know, we know that it's a, a mental health challenge for um, people who create work to then be totally isolated. Um, and I think there's something similar for, for folks who are working on the other end of things and facilitating that work. Um, so now that things are back out in person um, and we have events again, I mean, we're, we're really, really looking forward to being out in community and doing a lot more kind of like tabling paper information, like really connecting with people. So hopefully that helps as well. That's a great segue to uh, my next question. In the same um, spirit of artists, you know, being confined to just a desk, all right, it presents uh, mental health issues or uh, hopefully not opportunities, but uh, possibilities. Um, same could be said for the artists in the community who are looking for uh, access or to sit with you, or not you necessarily, but your department. Um, and so, and, and it's usually non-traditional ways, right? Because artists, uh, I work really hard to sit still. Um, and it's, you know, you, you know this, right? If you're an artist, it, it's a lot of work to be able to be that sort of administrative, you know, person. Um, how, like, I guess, you know, looking at, I guess this is a suggestion, looking at uh, non-traditional ways of table, I like that. Um, paper, I like that, more access. Yeah. If people have digital challenges or barriers. Um, but also, like, non-traditional ways of saying, like, you know, the coffee hour, I don't know what, but if you have a community person, community engagement person, that is specifically saying gen generally, because artists will come to you and not necessarily have a presentation or, yeah know how to give you their ideas. It's just a whole bunch of like, right? That's, and, and that's, how, that's how we are, that's how we present. Um, 
until we finally are connected with, you know, you, you can write for this grant or whatever. So I was happy to hear about technical assistance, but in how we are breaking that down to from the beginning, access, meeting, brainstorming, to technical assistance, to execution, um, I think would be very helpful so that folks can feel like, yeah, they do care. They, they, they have provided the service and they are intentional about undoing harms and in inequities or disenfranchised communities because they are looking at me as an individual and my needs to gain access to arts. Um, if you have a comment about that, if not, I think that was more of a statement. No, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, I think you know this, this round of contracts that we're gonna be doing um, to support individual creatives is definitely a, kind of an experiment for us. Um, and so we're hoping to maybe form relationships with um, with new providers who like we, you know, might not pop up on like a kind of traditional arts um, list of some kind. So I think that the idea is that we'll be able to reach a lot of new people um, who might not be originally connected to our services. Um, and who I think, you know, we have a barrier of um, people not associating this work with uh, city government. <laughs> and so maybe assuming that it's a certain way and then um, once we finally have a conversation, you know, when we're in the room together, um, getting a sense of what we, can, what we can do for them and that we are here to serve them. Um, but uh, it still takes a lot, I think, uh, for someone to go from thinking, oh, I'm trying to do this as a creative person, I'm gonna go to city hall. Um, so I think I think you're right. Just I'm just emphasizing what you were just saying, which is finding other ways um, to connect with people is going to be important. Yeah, I mean, I do. You feel that you have enough funding to build capacity to do these things? I mean, I think that our proposal, along with the ARPA dollars, um, is a really good step in the right direction. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm hoping we can do this year. Uh, is some policy work on what the long-term support for arts and culture looks like in the city. Um, I mentioned in the ARPA hearing that the ARPA dollars would get us closer to comparable to other cities in terms of local public support. Um, uh, where we are right now um, without that funding is um, I think second to um, last out of about 15 cities that we've looked at around the country in terms of per capita dollars. But so this is kind of a, I would see this as a step in the right direction for a much longer term conversation about what does that really look like and where would we want it to be. Um, but I think the, the investments that we've asked for this fiscal year um, will definitely help with everything that we've talked about. In particular, um, one of those planning positions is really meant to be um, embedded in community and really be kind of on the ground with um, you know, whether it's displacement issues or different opportunities, things that people are just seeing kind of in their neighborhoods, that position is really supposed to be there for that and be um, like very accessible in that way. And so I think that will speak to some of what we're talking about. How much in total from ARPA have you requested? Um, we've requested 20 million over three years, over the three years of ARPA. In the interest of um, doing this with an equitable lens or doing this equitably, what, how, how will you ensure, because I mean, COVID-19 and what and who it impacted, how will you ensure that this arts also goes to who it mostly, was mostly impacted? Um, I mean, we're gonna bake that into the program design for any of the funding that goes out, kind of similar to what we're doing right now with the contracts, where we actually put right into the scope of work um, who this had to be for based on public health data, and that's the metric with which we're evaluating what comes back. Um, so I think we'll take a really similar approach that it's, um, and it's just very direct <laughs> and kind of common sense. If this is who is the most impacted, this is where the funding has to go, um, and that's a part of the review process for all of those dollars. Okay. I, I have one more question, Council Braden, then we'll turn to You're my colleague. You're the chair, Madam Chair. You, you know, I was waiting for you to stop me, because I'll just go, right? Um, it's only the two of us. It feels go. like a combo here. Um, uh, so you mentioned about this, um, you know, arts as part of the, like, holistic living. Um, and there are so many public housing mm -hmm. already in Boston, especially in my district. And I wonder then, and I was thinking, I, before I filed something, another thing, I was like, let me talk to BHA 
and ask them like if they've done any efforts on this. And my idea was that we would integrate arts and mental health uh, activities um, within the public housing spaces, right? So yeah. for example, I would come in and do sort of an arts therapeutic workshop, educate you on therapy, destigmatizing it, right? And creating this welcoming environment with arts, through arts. For example, it would be like, oh, arts and you know, paint night, you and your daughter can come to this workshop. You're learning about mental health, but you can also display your, you know, mostly visual, your art in this lobby. And then you could walk through every day and say, I belong here, right? So it's, it's like killing, you know, uh, birds with like feeding, one stone. Feeding two birds with one hand. Oh, the strength-based <laughs> language. I, you know, I can't with you millennials, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, right, so what do, you, what do you think of that? And um, are you already working with housing um, and mental health providers or? Yeah, it's, um, so this definitely falls under the category of, I think, making sure arts access is everywhere, especially in city-owned spaces where we can just kind of make it happen. Um, we've done work with, I think probably the best example is with um, Age Strong, working where kind of our skill set is to reach the teaching artists um, and the, the people who can really have like a high, create that high quality experience that does what you're describing and support them in doing that and then also work with um, whichever department or agency has kind of control over that space and help facilitate that process and um, fund and kind of match make to bring something like a sequential arts class or experience to um, a city location. So we did that with Age Strong, specifically looking at working with older adults um, and it was super successful. We had surveys um, done before and after with questions like, I feel like I can new learn new things or I feel like I'm isolated, or I can access new people, and the numbers went from like, you know, 40 some percent, I feel like I can learn new things, to in the 80s or 90 percent after taking the sequential learning class. So we know that it, like, I think some of us know instinctually that that's gonna be the case, but we actually have the numbers to you know, back that up. Um, so we've been looking at that program, which was a, a three-year partnership with Age Strong that kind of grew over time, where we piloted, and we did trainings, and we did support, and now it's much more um, kind of held by Age Strong themselves, which I think is the goal, right? We want to kind of pilot and test and support and then have that just be a part of what that department or agency does. Um, so we'd love to do the same thing with BHA and we've had um, preliminary conversations about how we could support that. I think um, funding to scale is always then the next step of that equation, um, but, but yes, we'd love to do some more of that work. Um, and we've had some really great experiences doing murals on BHA buildings and the kind of resident engaged process around those murals um, has been, I think, like a kind of a preview of what that can look like. Thank you. Councilor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have to speak to the, the, um, the resident engaged uh, murals on the BHA buildings. There's one on Patricia White out in, uh, in Brighton and uh, the, the community were very, very excited to participate in that and they really felt like they had some, some ownership of the process and the product, and they wouldn't just somebody come along and painted a mural on their building one day, so that was important. Uh, also, in terms of outreach, um, you know, the the, um, the, f the folks with disabilities um, and differently abled folks, I think that's another part of the dem demographic that we sometimes forget about. And yeah. and I know f from my background in rehabilitation that um, there's incredible um, opportunities for adaptive expression through arts and um, you know, we keep, keep the Disabilities Commission engaged as well. Because yeah. I think that's the thing, it's the huge tapestry of all the folks that actually live in, in Boston, it's touch all of them. Um, so in terms of the certification of artists so that they can get um, um, artists housing, um, how many people do we have certified as artists? And, and, and then how many housing units do we actually have in the city? What sort of an inventory do we have at this time? Um, the exact numbers I might have to follow up with you on. I think in terms of certified artists, I want to say we're over the 2,000 mark on that, but I, on both of those I can follow up and get you 
um, a number, an exact number. And is there a lot of interest? Like, do you get inquiries regularly about people registering as certified? We do. Artists? Yeah, we we get a steady stream um, of artists uh, looking for what we now call artist housing certification to make it clear that it's about um, accessing affordable housing opportunities. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's a, it's a little bit tough in the sense that, um, as we were just talking about, a lot of units, it feels like there's a good number of units in the pipeline, but those are going to be delivered kind of bit by bit. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely a lot more demand than um, what's being constructed. And then um, we've also been, as we follow people kind of through the journey of the application process, getting a sense of where we can play more of a role in making that successful. So um, there were some units in Mission Hill recently where we actually did like a virtual kind of um, open house of that of those units in that building and invited um, artists who are on the artist housing certification list to see that and kind of get like an open house tour of what that space was and ask questions and you know you start to get into the detail of you know can I fit this size instrument in that space or you know you get into some of the weeds of what the um, design guidelines are also supposed to help um, create in advance so mm -hmm. we're able to kind of see a little bit more from um, the kind of life span of a project like that where there are other places where we can play a role yeah, yeah. Now, the other question I had was with regard to um, you know music venues or places where they make the sound issues and then a new a new condo unit gets built next door or something in London I can't remember the name for it it's agent of change agent of change do we have a policy and do we work with that sort of policy here in the city we don't have an agent of change policy it's something that we've talked about in the past with um, the BPDA um, I think it's something we could bring up again now with the new um, chief and see what that might look like um, it kind of uh, I think this is my understanding, I don't want to misrepresent, but that the compliance piece of this is always what is tricky. So we can kind of say in a cooperation agreement with the development that they need to include certain terms as a part of their lease that says you acknowledge that there's going to be you know, noise in this building or on the street, um, but we don't really have um, capacity as a city to necessarily follow up on that and make sure that that's actually what's being done. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a part of the question there, but it is something that we've had conversations about. Yeah. So yeah. I think we probably need to continue that conversation yeah. in the light of all this new development that's um, impacting already established venues and, and spaces, so that will be good to look at. Um, I think that's all I have. Oh, yes, Rita Hester mural, uh, or where are we at with that one? Um, the design was just approved last night at the Art Commission meeting. Um, I believe if we don't have the commitment from the owner about the wall in writing yet, we will shortly. Mm -hmm. So it's all moving ahead. And is it deadlines? Like we, have a, we have to have it all sealed and done and not completed, but commissioned and, and, and well, I don't know. Is there a deadline to have it completed or? Um, I think we're looking to have it going up this summer. Yes. So we have a deadline June thirtieth, um, but if we have to spill into the next fiscal year, we can do yeah. that. Yeah. One thing we want to make sure of with that project is that there's enough um, opportunities around it for people to gather, or have events, or have, I think, some processing time. Um, even seeing the um, artwork last night, I know many of us were like already just in tears, just having the conversation, and so. Um, want to make sure that there's enough space around the actual painting of the artwork also. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Braden. Um, can you tell me about your vision for Upham's, uh, Upham's Corner or um, also to include the Strand Theater? Yes. Um, so I think speaking to the Strand, um, what I mentioned earlier, uh, I, we're, we're excited about the idea of investing more in the theater. You know, we've been through this time of um, trying to see if there were other theater operators out there who would want to um, help run the space. That happened to coincide with COVID. And, you know, we heard directly from some people who had been interested that this was just not a time where they could, you know, take on something that um, is, is an experiment in a way. Um, so I think in the end, um, that was a good process to go through. Um, that's the process that we worked on with the community um, over the last few years. Um, but now we're at a place where I think 
Um, we've learned more about what we can do to um, improve the operations of the theater, um, what we kind of need to know in terms of um, being able to put more resources into marketing the space and thinking about what the business model really could be between revenue producing um, shows and kind of more community available shows and how to balance that time. Um, so I think the hope is that the theater can continue to be um, kind of a vibrant, community accessible space, really a hub for um, uh, both the immigrant community in Upham's Corner, but also for um, the black and BIPOC community in Boston um, as a place to really house performing arts activity. Um, and that it can actually bring in enough commercial work to actually be able to support itself to some extent. Um, and we know that there's always going to be um, big facilities costs, there's always going to be staffing costs. Um, we'd like to add some staff if possible um, and make the case for that. Um, but we do think that it is feasible to have a sustainable business model for this space, at least when it comes to kind of rental revenue and programming and keeping it subsidized. Do you currently have grants that are available for the uh, productions that are coming in or people of lower yeah. income? Yeah, we have some grants available now and it's based, I believe, on the um, size of the production and the cost um, of tickets for the production. Um, so there's more funding available if something is free or low cost. Um, and Are you scaling that to sale, like if they only sell half of it or Yeah, I, I can get you more of the details on it. I'm not, I don't have it top of mind right now exactly how that um, was articulated. Um, so those are being made available now and it's a little bit of a trial. So we're um, starting with folks who have rented um, already and who are, we know are struggling with um, figuring out how to make it work. Um, so is that out? Is that available now? It's available now. Yeah. Um, and we'll make it available again next year. Um, maybe with some tweaks based on what we learned from this year. Um, we're also hoping that for, um, uh, with through the ARPA funds that there might be an opportunity to, um, kind of solidify and formalize having some activity in residence in the theater. So as opposed to a grant for a one-off production, an actual contract to deliver the kind of programming that is a part of the mission and vision of the theater that the community has articulated that they want to see um, that is, again, free or low cost um, to the community. And so that would be kind of an ideal scenario to have kind of like community anchor programming in the space. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, your department is about almost 90% female. Can you, 80-something. Um, yeah. Um, can you... Tell me what, like, what are your challenges with hiring male artists? <laughs> um, I don't know if we have a challenge with hiring male artists. I think it would be interesting to look at the gender breakdown of our contracts. Um, but I don't know if there's really, if there's a challenge staffing wise. I'm going by the dem demographics that you provided um, for your department. It, in that line for 2022, is close, well, 2021 was higher, was like definitely at 90. Um, oh no, 80%, sorry, my glasses are not, oh, 76%, 76% um, for 2022. Um, and I, I know that there are so, I mean, I know so many, right? Um, especially in um, the black community. And I just wonder if you were having challenges, if we could support you in any way with finding people. Yeah, I mean, we would love to um, send the vacancies that we have right now um, and get help making sure that they um, get staffed up. I don't know that there's a, a specific challenge around male-identified folks, but um, I do think that it's just been a really hard time for anybody in, the, in our sector and just in the world in terms of um, retaining people. Uh, I've been optimistic about some of the direction that the central HR is going in, um, in terms of uh, having clarity around like hybrid work and some of those things as well. Um, because I think, you know, we have had folks in and out of the office in the last two years and some of them have just not stayed for very long. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the kind of like level of transaction-based work that we've been doing with federal funds and CARES Act money and kind of getting grants out. I think it kind of goes back to 
what I was saying that, you know, we don't get into this line of work to just be on a spreadsheet and not be having kind of uh, relational work with people. Um, so I think we're optimistic about being able to fill those roles, but we'll take absolutely take help um, because we will have, if this moves forward as proposed, three, four, five vacancies, I believe. So it's a really good opportunity. In the RFI, I, I asked for a breakdown of the contracts and which one are women-owned and BIPOC. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually see it here. Could you email it to me? Uh, yes, I know that there was an appendix. Um, Unless I'm looking just at, together. The, just at the equity one, um, but there might be another presentation that you sent. I, I only see, I'm looking at the equity one and the question of um, contractors was there, but there was no actual, like, I wanted to see. Yeah, there should be a list of them. We can make sure you have that. Please. Yeah. Yeah, I see, a, I see the breakdown by um, like 50, you know, by percentage, but not the list. Mm -hmm. We can get you that. Thank you. Um, I, don't, I don't have um, any other questions. I mean, the housing questions obviously is super important. Um, I one time was looking at that program because I was like, oh, my kid can go to college and then I'll be by myself and I'll do arts. Um, and I, I got certified, and, but I know that you don't have enough housing to actually support people yeah. through that program. How are you working with MOH or DHA or administration to increase the, the numbers? Yeah, we've had um, really great collaboration from the housing office um, and really thinking about, and I didn't answer the second half of your question about the vision for Upham's Corner, but thinking about when we have um, uh, RFPs for that include housing and they're in these um, areas that we've all been working on that have this kind of creative economy um, and creative uh, workforce that we are including affordable artist housing um, as a part of the city directed mandate for what should be there. So we have had um, some of these units are um, coming from those collaborations. Um, there's also been a lot of just trying to work with the private sector um, and kind of encourage, say like this is what we're looking for in the city. If you're going to be um, bringing housing into a cultural district, like really consider making this the, one of the primary um, ways that you could do that. Um, and so we have some buildings that have a much higher percentage of affordable artist housing that where we know the developer and we've had those conversations kind of ahead of time and that's been more baked into the process. Um, I think the other piece is that we are focusing a lot more on the spaces for people to work and making sure that if you can't have an artist live work unit that you can at least have an affordable space to be able to do your practice, whatever that is, um, because there's always gonna be more support for affordable housing writ large, right? So we wanna make sure that um, people who are looking for housing can get that, even if it's not artist live work housing and that we're still facilitating that conversation and pointing people to housing resources and then really working on this issue of where can you actually make creative work in the city of Boston, um, which is really that focus on cultural planning that we were talking about. I guess, yeah, that and a balance of what you're paying your staff as well, right? So like, you know, making sure that people can actually, the cost of living in Boston is like terrible, mm -hmm. right? Um, making sure that we're also paying artists um, sufficient, um, sufficiently so that they can live in Boston and not be displaced. Yeah. And I think that, you know, like every, I'm sure every chief wants to pay their staff more, right? Yeah. So, um, would you say that you are where you want to be in terms of your funding to, for personnel? Um, I think we are given the conversations that we've been able to have um, internally. I, mean, I was mentioning being really optimistic about HR. Um, we uh, have had really good conversations about actually doing a, an assessment of the office overall. Um, so really looking at kind of every position and um, what every um, kind of uh, pay range is and seeing what we need to do to make sure that that's also equitable as an office across positions and job descriptions. Um, so we've been very kind of open in that conversation um, with them um, and look forward to, to doing that process. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't um, have more and whatever questions I have left, I think I can submit them to you. Um, do you have any closing statements before we close? Um, no, I would just say thank you and um, appreciate the time um, and look forward to just making sure that we have continued conversation as we're getting these things 
out the door. Um, really, really excited to be able to just be in conversation with the city council about how we're making sure that everything lands um, with what you're seeing in your district um, and in everyone's districts. Um, and uh, I think we're all, as a staff, really excited to be out, at, like I mentioned, at events, going to spaces, um, and so really hope that we can have a kind of a two-way conversation with all of the counselors about um, how we make that happen. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, I'll close on the art corridor, and I had a conversation um, with administration and other people, and, and the, all the folks that are like coming together to, to do this, and I'm really excited. Um, we've officially um, passed a resolution, and we've named it the Ottery, and hope that um, we can continue that trend, like an Ottery, right, to a heart, um, where we go down Dudley Street, and we also can connect it to South End and create some of that, um, in, you know, cross-culture kind of activity or tourism or whatever. Um, and I, in the spirit of that, this, you know, Roxbury, as we know, is uh, at least very sensitive to um, how we are intentional about creating or connecting arts to history um, of Roxbury. And I think that my conversation, um, and I'm, I'm someone who likes to be fully transparent, and then if it's not political enough to get me to be, be effective, then um, I'll adjust as I go, but I have faith in uh, the creator and the universe that um, it's better to speak truth, and then hopefully that people will, uh, you appeal to people's better nature and they'll appreciate it and not underestimate you as being disarming or kind or at least trying to be kind. Um, and I wanna say to you on record that for me personally is, it's very crucial that we work on uh, really accentuating and um, building up this asset mapping, this visual asset mapping mm -hmm. of Roxbury to its true um, core. Um, and that means to the black history in Roxbury um, that we're intentional on how we're executing that. Um, and I really appreciate your openness to be able to have those tough conversations about, you know, who are we placing or how are we doing it or what art are we installing. Um, and I just, I'm re very excited um, to have to work with all of the departments, but particularly with you, because every time I do speak with you, um, I can say to you, hey, Chief, um, I think your you know, department needs help, like a little bit of adjustment in terms of hiring more black people. And you'll say, yeah, I think so too. And so like, and then to follow that with um, action and manifesting hopefully uh, camaraderie between um, communities and as well as departments, as well as the council, uh, to do this work in a real intentional way. I, I appreciate you for your work. I have a lot of respect for you in terms of your execution, um, as well as how you present it, and I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>